Okay. Kia ora koutou, uh, morena, good morning and uh, welcome. I'm going to uh, start with a karakia, so we'll just have some quiet please. Me inoe tato, e te atua, tenei au, tenei mātou. Au mema kua poti te hapori o Whanganui. Arahina i a mātou. Ki te wakatau nā whakataunga pai. Mō te rohi mō nā tangata katoa. Kia piki ai te ora o te hapori. Me nā iwi kata o Whanganui. Homi e, hui e, taiki e. Let us pray, dear God, here I am, here we are. Your elected members of Whanganui guide us to make good decisions for the district, for all people, to uplift the community and all peoples of Whanganui. Bring forth unity, it is done. So, uh, yeah, welcome, uh, uh, welcome to all those um, in the chambers today. You're very welcome. Um, and welcome to those that are online as well. So, um, uh, a, fair, a fairly big agenda today. Um, but the first item I'm, um, is uh, apologies. I understand we have no apologies. Uh, leave, of, um, leave of absence. I understand there are no leave of absence. So, uh, and the fourth item is declarations of interest. Do, does anyone have uh, any declarations of interest to declare? Councillor Kate. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I um, have a declaration to make an item in relation to items 8 point, uh, probably just 8.3, but 1 and 2, in that I have signed personally the petition um, to cease fire conflict in Gaza. Um, I'm not intending to step away from the table because that is a personal um, action that I've taken, um, not a council but happy to accept your advice if you think okay. otherwise. Great. No, look, I, I think, um, I imagine there may be others who are in that uh, position as well who've uh, signed the petition. Um, and I think I might be one of them, I'm not sure. No, <laughs> Am I? I don't know which... All oh, right. OK, there you go. So I didn't know which petition I'd signed and which one I hadn't, so there you go. Um, so I, I, if, if that's the case, I'm also in that, in that grouping as well. Is there anyone else that would like to declare that? As well. so, Helen. so I don't, I th look it's a personal view, I mean, um, and it's around, uh, for me it's around peace and unity and so that's not a, not a bad thing but we can talk more about that. But uh, Away from the table for this one. Okay, no problem at all. Just to confirm that we've gone over five points. Has anyone decided how to proceed in the past? It was three, five, three, anyone else? I think that's three, three. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, so no other declaration? Oh, Councillor Charlotte. Sorry, can I just get some clarity um, over um, Michael stepping away from the table? Um, I don't think you declared a, an interest, did you? Yes. You did, okay. Okay, great, so no other declarations of interest, okay. Yep. What's that? Yeah. All right, uh, so... Uh, the next item is uh, item five, a mural message. So this is my message uh, to the community, um, to those in the room, but also online. And um, uh, and uh, just to what's top of mind for our council and for me at the moment. So only a few weeks ago, I sat next to Sir Robert Martin, and now we have learned of his passing on 30 April. As he sat next to me, his words echoed today when he asked us to council's progress on our district's disability strategy. Sir Robert was one of our own who championed the rights of disability community here in Whanganui, around New Zealand, and indeed across the world. In 2008, he became a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit, and in 2020, a Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to people with disabilities. Sir Robert broke through many barriers, including being the first New Zealander with an intellectual disability to be knighted, and he also served on the United Nations Committee on the rights of persons with disabilities since 2017. His election was historical, with him being the first person with a learning disability elected to the United Nations treaty body. 
Our condolences to his wife, Linda. And I'd actually like to take a moment's silence just to reflect on his service. Yep, serve a stand, yep. Thank you. So back to uh, Sir Robert with his words still echoing uh, of what is happening with our disability strategy. Well, two things. Uh, the first is that an announcement will be made soon about a new initiative championing a portfolio structure outside of the governance framework led by elected members to bring our council even closer to the people. One of these will be a portfolio dedicated to disability, accessibility and possibility. I'll talk more about that soon. The latter concept of possibility has been a new one for me, but is the brainchild of another new resident to Whanganui, Minnie Baragwanath, who I also met with in the last few weeks. Minnie, who many of you may not know, but she's a recipient of the Sir Peter Blake Leadership Award, member, made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit, received the New Zealand Woman of Influence Award for Diversity and was named by Zonta International as one of 100 Women of Achievement for her leadership and advocacy for social change. Minnie is also the founder of the Global Centre of Possibility at AUT, which is a New Zealand-based, globally networked centre of possibility, leadership, design and innovation with the aim of creating, creating a future that is truly accessible for all. When Minnie was 14 years old, she was diagnosed with an, with an incurable eye disease causing her to progressively lose her sight. Minnie sees the world differently to most of us, both literally and figuratively. The concept of disability is a spectrum and the possibility spectrum represents the transition from the deficit-focused disability world as a cost or a burden. Accessibility recognises we all have access needs and can all benefit from a more equitable society. And finally, shifting to the possibility world view, uh, where we are leading, designing and innovating all aspects of our future society and economy through a powerful and transform transformative lens of what is possible. Many cited an example of the world of possibility referencing a friend of hers in Auckland who is, who is becoming progressively deaf. From a possibility lens, her friend sought to develop an artificial intelligent avatar who would provide sign language to those who are deaf, only to find that it was just the head and not the hands on most avatars. Cara technologies are now well advanced in developing a sign language avatar. Uh, welcome to the world of possibility. Minnie is an inspiration. Uh, she is also, no, also has an aspiration for Whanganui to become the world's first city of possibility. I am keen that we help realise Minnie's aspiration and to honour Sir Robert's lifelong fight for disability, or should we say, possibility. Last week I also met with a young woman involved in the tech sector who has moved here from Silicon Valley, the world's tech capital, who has never been here but made Whanganui her home. She was introduced to me by Minnie, both of whom are excited about Whanganui's future. On 25 April we had a number of Anzac Day services across the district, and it was wonderful to see the turnout uh, to honour those who have served and fought for our freedom, many who have been killed in action. Today we live in a free society thanks to those selfless, selfless individuals. I would like to repeat a few words of my Anzac Day speech which emphasise the desire for peace and unity in our community. According to the Geneva, Conven uh, the Geneva Academy, there are 118 armed conflicts around the world currently, right now. Today is a reminder and acknowledgement of all those who have fought for the paradox of both peace and victory at the same time. I do believe, though, that fighting for peace starts with all of our small actions to show love and humanity within our own community. Perhaps our own war right now is not on the literal battlefield, but rather the figurative one of an increasing creeping of social division and social angst. 
We do not have to be this way, though. Let us be people that are able to challenge our own firmly held mindsets. Let us be a community that celebrates and honours different perspectives or beliefs. Let us be a community that looks for the positives, the glass are full. Let us be a community that can debate and disagree with the respect and play the ball, not the man. Let us be a community that supports each other. Let us have respect for a different viewpoint, replace a different view with an openness to see the other persons, shake hands after a disagreement, smile and provide a positive word to our neighbour. Take time to repair broken relationships with a spirit of forgiveness. That is the best way we can preserve the cause of those who have served and fought for our peace. Today we will also be, we will receive a petition requesting a ceasefire in Gaza. From my perspective, the petition to promote peace and unity is one we should champion. To the recently completed consultation process uh, for the long-term plan, uh, we have made a significant gain in what I call taking counsel to the people by being more transparent, open and visible. The byproduct of this has seen a record number of, trans, uh, of submissions from 600 previously to over 1,600. There were bets as to whether we would hit the 1,000 mark, but that has been well and truly smashed. I want to say thank you to our community for engaging with our council. I also want to say thank you to the significant effort the elected members put into the lead-up to this with additional hours deliberating and debating what should and shouldn't go into the draft long-term plan. Finally, I want to say thank you to the significant work from council officers to analyse and prepare material and support the consultation process. We have just today met with the President and the CEO of Local Government New Zealand. There is no doubt that councils across New Zealand are feeling the strain of rates, funding and financial pressure not seen in a generation. The average rates increase for the next year annual plan year across New Zealand is sitting at 15.3%. And it is little comfort that many mayors are envious of our position in Whanganui, um, of our current overall rates increase on average of 10.6%. For me, I have talked about finding the balance between affordability and aspiration. We need to focus on being affordable for now. But if we do nothing more than the basics, it means the rate paying will get more challenging. Non-rates revenue, I believe, will be the new black for our councils across New Zealand and indeed the world. The sooner our councils seek new revenue opportunities, the better we will be in the long term. Therefore, aspiration is a key part of our conversation and the balance between affordability and aspiration is indeed a tight rope. Our response to affordability is a six-point plan to find cost savings, efficiencies and revenue opportunities. From an aspirational perspective, we need to ensure that we have a district which is a great place to live for our future generations. People have said to me that we need to stick to the basics. We are spending over $360 million on infrastructure over the next 10 years, which I believe is a record amount. However, that in, in and of itself will not take us into the future. We need to think differently and take a risk-based approach to delivering for our future. I believe our current plan, draft plan and aspirations find the balance between affordability and aspiration for our future. I am though, like we all are around the table, looking forward to reading all of the submissions and hearing our community at the hearings. I suggested some time ago that it would be great to have our scheduled two days of hearings move to three days. Now I think there's a strong chance. Thank you. Right. Uh, item uh, six is the uh, public forum and deputa or deputation. Uh, I understand we don't have any. Um, item six is uh, also confirmation of minutes of 26 March 2024. Um, that the minutes of the council meeting held on 26 March 2024 are confirmed as a true and accurate record. I'm happy to move that. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Josh? Uh, all those in... Um, oh, if there are no... Oh, so all those in favour? Aye. Against? Motion is carried. Right. Um, 
So we're now on to item 8.1 and uh, once again I uh, thank you for those uh, members of the public that are in the chamber, there are some outside, there are um, elsewhere, those listening in. Uh, welcome to the chambers. The first three items are around um, uh, the disruption and the conflict in the Middle East at the moment and so uh, thank you for, for being here to present that. Uh, item 8.1 uh, is, uh, is a petition from the Palestinian Solidarity Network, Aotearoa, calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Um, and uh, I also uh, note that 8.2 8 as well, and 8.3, um, that we received a notion of motion, a notice of motion from Councillor Josh Shandala Mackay in relation to the first, this is the first petition as well. So I welcome uh, Ruby Hazen, who is, uh, is it, sorry, is that how you pronounce your name? Sorry, I'm afraid that Ruby cannot be here today, so I'm presenting on behalf of Wanganui PSNA, Sophie Reinhold is oh, my Oh, Sophie, name. sorry, yes, yeah, you did say that. Um, I had uh, my notes here, Ruby, but welcome, Sophie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and um, so uh, I understand you're delivering two petitions, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, great. So let's go through these one at a time. Um, the first, as I said, 8.1, uh, which is that the Council receive the petition from uh, Palestinian Solidarity Network, Aotearoa, calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Um, and um, the recommendation is for Council to formally receive the petition. We have read the report, and you have five minutes, if you wish, to speak to the petition uh, uh, calling, uh, related to calling for immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. So, over to you, Sophie. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I will actually be speaking to both petitions in my speech now, if that's all right. Kia ora koutou, ko Sophie, ta Sophie Reinhold taku ingoa. Dr. Nafiz Gamri, a Kiwi Palestinian cardiologist who has served our community for 19 years, was meant to be here this morning, but he has given me leave to speak in his stead. I'm sure you can appreciate how much Nafiz wanted to be here to speak to you. Nafiz has personally lost his first cousin, who was shot by an armed drone while assisting people escaping the debris after a bombing. His uncle has been kidnapped, as has his deaf and mute auntie. Their whereabouts are still unknown. He has lost family members who were nurses and ambulance drivers, all of whom worked at Al Shifa, worked at Al -Shifa Hospital. There are 40 members of his family still unaccounted for. Their houses have been confirmed as having been destroyed, but due to communication blackouts, Nafiz is struggling to reach them. He doesn't know if they are sheltering in tents in Rafa or if they are under the rubble. But Nafiz has patients in, Wanganu in the Wanganui community who need him, and so once again, he puts others before himself, before his own pressing need to speak about the issue. Dr. Gamli was born at Nasser Hospital in Gaza. Since the start of the war on Gaza six months ago, thousands of displaced civilians have been sheltering in all the major hospitals in the area. Tragically, this hospital, along with 24 of the 36 hospitals and health care facilities in Gaza, has been completely destroyed. Another of these hospitals, Al Shifa Hospital, was described by doctors working for Doctors Without Borders as the beating heart of the Gazan medical system. After a two-week-long assault on Al-Shifa Hospital by Israeli Defense Forces, it is now the site of mass civilian graves that the international community, including the European Union and the United Nations, has demanded independent investigation into. Until there is a ceasefire, there can be no end to the suffering of civilians on both sides. Until there is a ceasefire, international humanitarian aid agencies cannot operate safely. The passage of aid cannot be guaranteed, and essentials such as water, food, maternity kits, antibiotics, and anesthetics will continue to be blocked from entering Gaza. The head of the United Nations World Food Program has stated that it is a, there is a full-blown famine in northern Gaza moving its way south. Without a ceasefire, foreign war correspondents will still not be allowed unhindered access to Gaza just one of so many worrying precedents which are being set by this war. So what does Wanganui District Council have to do with calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, a place that most of us here today will never get to visit and whose people we may never meet? Well, what is happening in Gaza is affecting the residents of Wanganui. 
It is affecting Palestinian, Lebanese, and Israeli citizens here in our community, and all of us who are bearing witness to the devastation. Without political pressure on a nationwide and an international scale, nothing will stop. Right now, right now Israel is being led by the most right-wing government it has ever had, an extremist right-wing government one that is dedicated to the end of the two-state solution, one that has displayed contempt for international law, international conventions, international humanitarian aid agencies, and United Nations Security Council rulings. There are weekly protests in Israel calling for Netanyahu's resignation, with thousands upon thousands of Israelis in attendance. Only through intense political pressure from the ground up can we see an end to the violence being wrought upon Gaza and the West Bank. At Wanganui PSNA, we want to see all the hostages brought home. We want to see an end to the mass slaughter. In 215 days, over 34,000 Palestinians have been killed, over two-thirds of them being women and children, with thousands more still unaccounted for under the rubble. Nothing justifies this. Nothing, not self-defense, not human shields, nothing. We want an end to a military bombardment that has left 19,000 children orphaned or separated from their parents. All of these numbers feel inconceivable. The scale is too vast. I ask you to remember that each and every one of these numbers represents somebody's everything. A United Nations Development Program assessment has stated that they estimate if a permanent ceasefire was to be called tomorrow, it would take approximately 16 years to clear the debris. More than half of the housing in Gaza has been destroyed, along with all 13 of Gaza's universities. The cost of rebuilding Gaza grows exponentially each day that the fighting continues. The debris is littered with toxins such as white phosphorus, around 7,500 tons of unexploded ordnance, and the remains of loved ones. We at Wanganui PSNA want Wanganui District Council to once again prove that you stand for human rights, for civilian rights, as you did in 2022 when you unanimously called for a ceasefire in the case of the Russia-Ukraine war. We want you to address our two petition submissions signed by over 2,200 local residents in the space of two and a half weeks, 34 hours of signature collecting to be precise. To be clear, that's a signature a minute. We want you to consider the appeal by 48 local businesses and organizations to stand for a ceasefire and to ensure that Council's procurement policy legally aligns with the United Nations Security Council's Resolution 2334. We, we are a group of peaceful volunteers who went out and heard the voices of the community. We were thanked again and again by Wanganui residents for giving them the opportunity to help, to feel that they were taking action in some small way. And we were told again and again to keep up the good work. If we had had more time to engage with the wider community and this issue had been less pressing to present to council, we are sure that we would have had even more overwhelming support for this motion. What we are witnessing here is not normal. This is not business as usual. The war on Gaza has broken too many records, too many conventions of warfare. Those of us bearing witness cannot help but experience a deep trauma on behalf of and alongside the people of Gaza. The countless horrific images and stories coming out of Gaza are so inhumane, so unbearable, that I personally and many others will never be able to forget, and we will be forever changed by these events. It needs to stop. We need you, Wanganui, to be the moral compass that points the way for our country's leaders. We need the Wanganui District Council to work with us to ensure that bigotry is rejected by this council, that our community rejects anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and racism, and to say that this council, this place, stands for human rights. A call for a ceasefire from our political leadership gives our community clear guidance on what is acceptable and what is not. In the absence of this, misguided declarations that are steeped in hatred are emboldened. Taking a stance to advocate for an end to violence against civilians makes our community safer for everyone. Criticism of the government of Israel is not anti-Semitism. My husband Mark, sitting here in the audience today, is Jewish, 
and he and his family firmly states, not in our name. Never again means never again for anyone. All loss of civilian life is abhorrent. All loss of civilian life needs to be investigated and tried by institutions such as the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. For this, we need you. We need you, Wanganui District Council, to speak up in order to be heard. We need you to give voice to our plea for a ceasefire, because it is only with a ceasefire that we can begin the process of justice. It is only through the process of justice that we can begin to plant the seeds from which peace will grow. Thank you for your time today, for hearing the voices of our community, and for standing on the right side of history. If I may leave you with one more final quote from the World Health Organization as of this morning, a ceasefire is urgently needed for the sake of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That was uh, passionately um, uh, presented. Though. Thank you. Uh, elected members, um, we have uh, up to uh, 10 minutes uh, to uh, ask questions specifically related to an immediate and permanent ceasefire um, in Gaza. So do we have any questions? Councillor Glenda. Thank you. Thank you for your passionate um, I'm not going to call it a talk, but thank you for um, what you've got, what you had to share with us there. And I, I was um, pleased to hear that you're talking about both sides here, that it's not just a one-sided you know, view that you have, which is great. Thank you for that. I just, um, I just need clarification that um, the PSNA has collaborated with the um, Israeli community, I'm assuming that you have, because this is from both sides. So has the Whanganui um, Israeli community been collaborating with you on this? Or have you been collaborating with them? We haven't, oh, sorry, we haven't been collaborating with the Israeli community here. We have talked to them, letting them know about today, um, and just saying that this is where we would be, um, so that they would be made aware of it. We have Jewish people that have joined us mm -hmm. in our in our talk, but they are not they are not Israeli themselves, right. but they are Jewish. Yeah. Okay. So they haven't had much input into this. No. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Um, the status of the ceasefire as of now. Can you clarify that? Because I understand that. Hamas have accepted a ceasefire, and what what is 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 a ceasefire actually occurring? From my understanding, um, as of last night, um, the Israeli Defence Forces have issued evacuation notices from Rafah, so they have told everyone that is in the east of Rafah to move up back up to Khan Yunis. So, basically, to go from what has become a tent town to go back up to the rubble of Khan Yunus. They are planning a military escalation. We don't know when, but it will be very soon. Um, so there was, they, there was promise on a ceasefire, um, but since then, um, Israel has, launched, has issued these evacuation notices which have been condemned by Hamas. Mm. So there was, there was some traction, but unfortunately it seems like um, that has fallen apart now. Great, thank you. My, my question relates to the signatures. Um, are they all from Whanganui residents or some of the signatures on the petition from outside of Whanganui? Um, if you will have a look at the accompanying um, letterhead, we specified um, the number of local residents and the number of um, people that just saw us and just were desperate to sign and we weren't going to stop them from signing. Sure. Um, yeah, so the exact numbers should be there. I believe that for the ceasefire petition, it was 1,907 local residents, yep. and then for the procurement one it was 400 and something, I'm not quite sure, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, great. I've seen that, I just thought it would be good for people to know. Yeah. That, uh, that's great though, thank you. No uh, and we've got a question from Josh Underlama. 
Councillor Josh. Thanks, Sophie. Um, my question follows on from Councillor Robbs, and it's around the ceasefire negotiations that have taken place to date. Would it be fair to say that the um, offers on the table have been caveated with particular terms uh, and also have been for specific time periods, which would distinguish them from the motion that's been asked uh, of us to adopt today? I would say yes. Um, yeah, um, we are basically just, no one has put it, put it on the table to actually have a permanent ceasefire. Um, and New Zealand has, along with Australia and Canada, they have called in the past for um, temporary um, ceasefires. At the UN Security um, Council, they asked, they ruled for a temporary ceasefire for the remaining, remaining two weeks of Ramadan, um, but that was ignored. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's okay. Great. Okay. Uh, no further questions. So I'm going to put the motion that the council uh, receive the petition uh, from, Palest uh, from the Palestinian Solidarity uh, Network, Aotearoa, calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Um, do I have a... Councillor okay. Kate, thank you. Um, all right. So, any comments on this matter? I do sense uh, that the majority of you appear to support this petition, so I'm happy to allow no more than three comments. However, I'm also interested in anyone that has an opposing view, um, and I'll save my comments for the right of reply. Uh, so, we have uh, Councillor Charlie. Thank you. <coughs> Mayor Andrew, it's not appropriate to take comments at the pre presentation of a petition. We have never done that in the past. We, the, a petition is presented, we ask questions, and it can be referred to a future meeting. It is inappropriate to members to voice their opinions either for or against the petition. Thank you. Okay, we'll just start yeah, six minutes. That's, that's true. Yeah, we can speak to the motion, right? Yeah. Comments on support. Yeah, all Okay, then we've got to clear because this is my script that we wrote out. So we need to just um, if the mayor wants to make a comment about formally say um and that comments are allowed for anything related to formally receiving the petition. Is that correct, Anna? That's right. So yep. just relating directly related to the receival of the petition. Is that okay? Um, okay, that's my, my, that's my guidance from... Uh, Mayor Andrew, can I, can I make a suggestion? This is, this is outside of standing orders, but I just wonder for the elected members that do want to speak whether it would be more appropriate to speak to the notice of motion, which is coming immediately following the petitions, which, and which that way comments? the broad range of comments that elected members might have can be fully traversed. Okay, that's, um, okay, that's a good idea. Yep, so I did say that at the start that 8.3 is related to this anyway, so, um, all right. So, um, so if there's no, no comments related to that specifically, I will um, put the motion on the screen um, that um, the Council receive the petition from the Palestinian Solidarity Network, Aotearoa, calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. All those in favour? All right. All those against? Anyone abstaining? So, motion is carried. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. No, great. So, we move to 8.2, uh, which is that the Council received the petition from the Palestinian Solidarity Network, Aotearoa, calling for a change in procurement policy. Uh, the petition requests the addition of the following wording that the Wangane District Council will comply with the United Nations Resolution 2334 and will not contract with the list of companies identified by the United Nations Human Rights Council as being involved in the building 
or maintenance of illegal Israeli settlements. Um, the recommendation is for Council to formally receive the petition to change the Council procurement policy. We have read the report. Uh, you've already uh, said that in, that in your commentary just before that you've already spoken to item 8.2. So um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Sophie? Just briefly. Um, yeah, just that um, I think aligning um, Council's procurement policy with the yeah, United Nations um, Security Council resolution is, is wise. Um, yeah, that's all. All right. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so uh, just like the previous item, we've got uh, time for any questions of clarification. Uh, Councillor Kate. Probably a question for the Chief Executive. Um, should this um, recommendation be approved through you, Mr Mayor, um, what would be the next steps from our perspective? Um, yes. Through you, Your Worship, next steps would be um, me and my team would go away and do a little bit of research. We would look at our current suppliers uh, and see if there was any immediate cause for concern. Uh, and then we would also start a bit of work researching and updating the procurement policy with a goal to bringing uh, an updated draft to Council for your approval in, in due course. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Kate's happy to uh, move. Do I have a uh, seconder, um, Councillor Philippa? Um, so, uh, any comments on? Uh, sorry, same issue. We're not going. We're going to move that forward. Sorry. Um, uh, so, um, questions. Yep. So, uh, do we have any questions? Before we go any further. So, um, so I'll put the motion on the screen uh, that the council receive the petition from, a pellet, from the Palestinian Solidarity Network, Aotearoa, calling for a change in procurement policy. All those in favour? Aye. Against? <coughs> motion is carried. Right, now to item 8.3, uh, which is related to this, but it's a notice of motion from Councillor Josh Shondala Mackay and seconded by Councillor Charlotte Melser that the Wanganui District Council uh, calls for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza, uh, B calls for the Government of New Zealand to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza and C condemns all acts of violence and terror against civilians on all sides in the Palestinian and Israeli conflict. So we've already um, I understand we've already moved that and seconded that by um, Councillor Josh and Councillor Charlotte. So I'm going to call uh, for comments. Just referring to the amendment to delay the motion. Okay, so there's. Uh, I'm going to write that up. So there's been. Okay, he does. He know what it is. Okay. Um, so I understand, Councillor Josh, you have. Uh, yeah, so I understand it's a, it's a fairly minor amendment to Part A of the Notice of Motion referring to um, all sides engaging in a ceasefire. Um, based on that wording, I'm comfortable with it. A and B. A, a and B, sorry. I'd like to see it written up there first, though, okay, before that's fine. proceeding. <coughs> and it's A as well, is that right? Mm. Can you just help with this uh, that Josh are proposing? Are you right then? Okay. We'll just deal with this one first.
four. And in B, you just need to fix the. So, uh, Councillor Josh and Councillor Charlotte, are you happy with? Yep, that? both happy. Okay. Uh, do you not want it moved and seconded? Um, I've moved an amendment. Well, my understanding is that Councillor Josh and Councillor Charlotte have already moved it and seconded it. So, so we're, we're comfortable with Councillor Glenda's amendment, so we don't need to debate that understanding orders as I understand it, um, whether that's the same for Rob's. We'll, we'll hear it and decide, I guess. Okay. Yep, correct. Okay, right. So we'll have to proceed with this one. Sorry, Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, the, the amendment is that... I know, uh, I, I'm, what I'm saying, is that my understanding is that we can't make an amendment to... Um, this notice of motion. No. <coughs> Is that correct, Anna? Under what? Yeah. Okay. Can you give me some advice on that? So, so for ease of <coughs> making making the debate as smooth as possible, I think it would be better for us to hear Councillor Vincent's <coughs> proposed wording and decide now whether we want to incorporate that in by majority, um, rather than dealing with it at a later stage and complicating matters further. And, right. that, and that is an amendment. Okay, so what, uh, what would you So the amendment for? is the, that the motions read in A and B that the Whanganui District Council calls for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza and the, and the addition of and the return of all hostages. And the same with B, it will read, the Whanganui District Council calls on the government of New Zealand to call for an immediate per and permanent ceasefire in Gaza and the return of all hostages. Okay. Um, Councillor Josh and Ch first. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm comfortable with seeing a return of all hostages on all sides incorporated into C. I'm not comfortable with it being incorporated into A and B because... Um, and I can go into this further in my speech, but the, the challenge that has prevented ceasefire, a ceasefire, a permanent and immediate ceasefire from occurring, has been that every deal has a caveat attached to it. And so what uh, Councillor Robb's, what Councillor Robb's amendment would do would be to attach a caveat to A and B, which is precisely the opposite of what we're trying to do here. But I'm happy to see it in C. <coughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to see it and okay, see. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Majority of members happy with that amendment? <coughs> yep. Okay. You yeah, can see general consensus, so let's um, stick with that. Um, all right. So, so, uh, do we have any questions related to, uh, questions of clarification related to uh, this notice of motion? Got your light on, Councillor Robb? Is that uh, just, okay, no, okay. Great, if there's um, no uh, further questions, um, I'm going to uh, call for comments, and Councillor Josh, I'll give you the uh, opportunity to comment first, and then <coughs> Councillor Charlotte, and uh, you also have the right of reply as well as the mover, so. Um, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. It's a honour to be able to bring this notice of motion um, to Council today on behalf of the Whanganui uh, Palestinian Solidarity Network and to reflect the considerable aspirations uh, of this community. And I want to acknowledge the people in our community on both the Palestinian and the Israeli side who have been deeply, deeply um, affected by this conflict, uh, who have friends and relatives, uh, associates in Gaza, um, in the region at the moment, 
who are experiencing this more deeply than anyone could possibly imagine. And that local impact is what makes it so important that council does send a strong uh, symbolic message, but also lobbies the government to up the ante on calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. And to me, what this notice of motion does is it, it's us asking ourselves what, what kind of community we want to be. Do we want to be a community that stands up for the vulnerable? Do we want to be a community that stands up for the marginalised? Do we want to be a community that says that even though this conflict is going on on the other side of the world, that in a globalised world that we live in, we're not removed from that. We're all human and we all feel conflicts in different ways um, and on deep, deep levels. This motion has a real tangible attach, attach to it as well. Local government all throughout the country is well positioned to lobby central government to adopt better, more comprehensive policy positions. And this motion is about us calling on our government to do its bit as part of the international community to stand up for human rights, to stand up for peace, and to say that a ceasefire, an immediate and permanent ceasefire should be uh, called for in the region, should be implemented in the region without any caveats attached to it. So that then negotiations towards the two-state solution and for peace can be achieved. And I think throughout history, what we've got to acknowledge as well is that collective pressure has always been what's driven social change. We saw it with the apartheid regime in South Africa. We saw it with the civil rights movements in the United States. And while the Whanganui District Council might be quite a small, seemingly insignificant part of this, as part of a collective, we can all make a difference. And if we all view ourselves in isolation, we can actually achieve nothing. And history shows that collective action is what generates social, political, and civil change. I want to acknowledge that as part of today, we will be joining uh, more than 70 cities in the United States alone that have called for a ceasefire of some description, not necessarily as um, fundamental as what we're asking for today, but that have called for a ceasefire. More than 250 international human rights-based organisations signing an open letter through Am Amnesty International calling for a ceasefire, as well as significant global bodies like the Catholic Church, um, the, the, the President of Brazil, uh, and a number of other significant global entities calling for a ceasefire as well. I want to touch on the final part of this resolution being the condemnation of all acts of violence and terror against civilians and a call for release of hostages. Because if it's not enough that nearly 35,000 people have been slaughtered, if it's not enough that, as Sophie's speech, um, as Sophie mentioned in her speech, that it will take 16 years to clear the rubble, uh, if it's not enough the, the malnutrition and the lack of uh, resources, the lack of infrastructure and so on, um, that has been caused through this conflict um, and the destruction of, um, of Gaza. If all of that's not enough, we need to think of it from a security perspective as well, in the sense that a cessation of violence and a two-state solution is good for Israel too. Because when you see an entire people left landless and stateless, uh, with no rights of citizenship under international law, um, desperate and hopeless, that's what drives extremism. That's what causes radicalization. And that is precisely the type of situation that we want to avoid going into the future. It's the only way peace in the region can be achieved. And I just want to finish off by commenting uh, quite clearly on some of the rhetoric that I've heard in the community over the last week or so in particular. And it's the false dichotomy that somehow we have to choose between the idea of backing Israel or backing Hamas. And I want to be really clear that being pro-Palestinian does not mean you're pro-Hamas. In the same way as being pro-Afghanistan does not mean you're pro the Taliban, or being pro-Iraq doesn't mean you're pro Saddam Hussein. 
this is the, the, the language that we use is so important because it speaks to our ability to actually engage with each other on these issues. And if we're talking past each other by using rhetoric um, that does not fairly or accurately reflect the situation that we're discussing, then we're never going to be able to come together and find solutions on these things. So I just want to be really clear that that false dichotomy represented in the language that I've heard over the last week or so has to stop. I'm going to leave it there by saying that I'd like all of my colleagues to strongly consider voting for this and for it to be a unanimous vote. <coughs> unanimous. Because we can send no stronger message to central government uh, than being totally unified on this issue. And finally, I want to thank everyone in the room um, regardless of where uh, you sit on this particular co uh, conflict for engaging in democracy because by being here and by participating in a petition where more than 2,200 people have signed and 50 businesses, you know, that's an example of when these institutions work the most effectively. And so thank you all for being here today and I'll leave it there. Kia ora. <coughs> Um, Councillor Charlotte. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, I'll keep mine quite short. Um, I want to thank everyone from the Palestinian Solidarity Network Aotearoa who have brought us this petition and all those who have signed it and those that have come to Council today. There's an incredible amount of supporting documentation and I want to congratulate you all on bringing this all together. Our community has a democratic right to bring us petitions. I personally thank you all for engaging in this process and bringing this to us. And it's a real opportunity to be the first council in the country to call for a permanent ceasefire and to stand up for civilians everywhere that have lost their voice. This motion is not controversial. This motion simply calls for a step towards peace. We don't need to over politicize this. We have an opportunity to once again stand and speak for peace and to support those in our community that are hurting directly from the impact of the war in Gaza. We need to think global and act local. Right, right thank you. Uh, Councillor Ross. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> A nice segue on the, on the global. What happens on the other side of this earth we have clearly expressed to us is happening to people in our community. The decision that we make today, I pray, has an impact on what is happening over there. We are one world. To get 2,200 votes on signatures on the petition in two and a half weeks is a mandate. My opinion, my personal whakapapa in this matter, for or against, doesn't matter. I'm not elected to express my opinion. I'm elected to represent the views of our community. 2,200 have spoken. Who am I to disagree with that? I will support it. Um, uh, Councillor Glenda. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I, th I think we'll all, we are all in agreement in this room about war. I detest war. It is senseless, it cheapens life, it destroys families, economies and countries. It's usually driven by greed, power or hatred. <coughs> Wars have been around almost since the beginning of time and no doubt will continue to plague the world as countries fight for either power or freedom. This war that we're talking about today is incredibly complex. It goes back centuries, actually. And I'm very pleased to see that we're talking about both parties here have responsibilities in this. It is not one-sided. Hamas have a covenant to annihilate the state of Israel. You can read it. You can look it up and read that for yourself. So they have a massive responsibility 
and a part to play in this as well. Extremism and radicalisation was pre present before Palestine became stateless. Because of these amendments to this motion, and only because of these amendments to this motion, I'll support it. I actually wasn't going to, but now that it's very clear that it calls for all parties in the conflict to take responsibility and for the, re for the release of all hostages, then I will support it. Uh, but only because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Rob. Thank you. Yes, um, and first of all, thank you to, to the petitioners. Um, we, we didn't know really what to expect today, um, but the behaviour and your attitude and the way you, you, you've presented to this council is exemplary, and I thank you for that. And I, like Councillor Glenda, um, really was going to vote against this uh, resolution uh, because I still am of the view that the Whanganui District Council Chamber is not where the echo of politics should be going on international politics. We are a local council and let's stick to local business. I understand your view, but that's my view. But in saying that, I also know that uh, in this community, I know an Israeli in this community, whose family, two of them were murdered on the October the 7th attack into Israel. Four of his family were taken hostage. Two are still in, as a hostage. And reading, and, and that's why I was motivated to put this clause on here about calling for the release of hostages. And I too, like uh, Councillor Glenda, recognise that this resolution, our, as it's worded, speaks to both sides in this conflict. That's important to me, and that's why I will be supporting it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Peter. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I will also be supporting this resolution, but I particularly will be voting for C, and that's condemns all acts of violence and terror, and that includes domestic violence here in our own community and holding perhaps our children as hostages to get our own way. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> um, yes, um, thank you to the petitioners and everyone here and online. I'd really like to thank um, Councillor Josh and Charlotte for bring, um, bringing this to Council and for the leadership of Mayor Andrew today and, um, and, and, and other councillors who have inputted to get what I think is a very, um, yeah, um, not surprisingly, a very wise and um, strong um, set of resolutions from this Council. Um, you know, New Zealand and Whanganui have got an incredible record and I won't know it all around human rights, but you know, when we're the first country in the world to give women the right to vote. Uh, the 1981 Springbok tour, amazing courage and leadership to the world around um, apartheid in South Africa. The Motua Gardens occupation, which helped to change so much um, around uh, sovereignty um, and freedom of, you know, I guess, the treaty and the importance of the treaty. Uh, for Wanganui and for New Zealand. Uh, our 2022 resolution around, and unanimous resolution to condemn the Russian um, government and stand by Ukraine, uh, things like the Rainbow Warrior uh, being a nuclear free New Zealand. Um, you know, we're a small, peaceful, strong and democratic country uh, and uh, our voice does matter. So I'm just really proud and humbled to be a Wanganui resident, a New Zealand citizen and vote to support this resolution, um, and particularly um, for the children of the world. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Jenny. 
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, to speak on this. I won't look at Sophie because she kind of gets an emotional reaction from me. Um, the situation in Gaza is, is go has gone beyond a war. And someone suggested to me but that previous to today that because I'd signed the petition, I was predetermined. Well, in this situation, I'm absolutely predetermined. I am so predetermined that it is totally unacceptable. Let's take this down to just one of many, many, many points. It's children. Tens of thousands of children have either been killed, you can insert murdered there if you like, starved to death or in the process of starving to death, have been orphaned or are missing. Tens of thousands. There is no justification for that. There is no political justification for that. There is no economic justification for that. And there is certainly no humanity in that. So yes, I support the resolutions. Thank you. Uh, I'll comment and I'll pass over to Councillor Josh. Um, just my, my comment's very brief and it's very simple. Um, we have 101 different nationalities in Whanganui. We live in a basically a global society here in Whanganui and my rhetoric is all about peace and unity um, in our own district in, here in Whanganui. And if we can promote that message for our own community but also for the rest of the world, that's something I hold strong to. That's my simple message. So calling for a ceasefire uh, in Gaza is as simple as that, is, is a very simple statement, but with profound intergenerational consequences if it happens, when it happens. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Josh, I'll, if you want to write a reply, you've uh, had quite a long go before, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I'm now going to put the motion on the screen that Whanganui District Council A calls to all parties in the conflict for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza, B calls on the Government of New Zealand to call for all parties in the conflict for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza, and C condemns all acts of violence and terror against civilians and calls for a release of all hostages on all sides in the Palestinian and Israeli conflict. All those in favour? All those against? And uh, we have one abstain. So the motion is carried. Well done. Uh, right, we are going to take a, an adjournment uh, for lunch. Um, it's now 12.37. Uh, we're a bit over schedule, so my suggestion is we're back at 1.15 uh, to continue the rest uh, or to, uh, for item 8.4. Um, so, great. See you soon.
Uh, welcome uh, back. Uh, moving to item uh, 8.4, uh, the Risk and Assurance Committee Chairs update, May 2024. So welcome, Susan Cosmalo, uh, Chair of the Audit, uh, Chair, of, Chair of the Risk and Assurance Committee. Yeah. Kia ora, thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. The purpose of this is just to highlight the strategic issues from the Risk and Assurance Committee meeting, which was the 2nd of May, so last Thursday. Um, one of the significant items is obviously on the agenda after my update, the one around the insurance, um, but a couple of other things that I'd just like to bring your attention to were that we received an organisational improvement update report. That sounds really important, and it is, but it is where we consolidate all the actions out of internal and external audits and monitor progress and keep pushing progress along uh, um, to ensure accountability for delivering on those issues that are raised. And I'm pleased to say that 82% of the outstanding items have been addressed. Uh, with only 18 left, and that, I mean, those numbers sound, there were a lot on there, and there have been a lot on there over the last few years, and we've gradually, uh, with a team, have gradually progressed those, resolved them, closed them, um, had Audit New Zealand sign some off, which I told you about at the last meeting. Um, so that's very pleasing to see, and we get that report regularly, so we'll continue to monitor it. Um, there are detailed action plans uh, for the completion of those remaining and they are the sorts of um, areas that we might look at around a deep dive or uh, a more intense look uh, as we progress if they are still outstanding and what, understanding why they are. I uh, if, when I talk about the organisational improvement report, I just want to acknowledge the risk manager, Debbie Watson, who really coordinates all of that for the team and does a really great job. So often, I haven't seen Debbie around this table uh, very often, but she comes to all and, and works really hard for the Risk and Assurance Committee, and I just wanted to acknowledge Debbie's work in that area. We had a um, number of reports around health and safety risks, uh, including the dashboards and the Chief Executive's Health and Safety Due Diligence Report, and they keep us really up to date with the current uh, health and safety risks and progress in there. We also, as part of the health and safety risks, um, had an update on the Construction Health and Safety New Zealand Report that was carried out early last year on the ac uh, uh, actions that were required after that big report and pleasing to see that uh, they've been prioritised and all of the necessary ones have been progressed. So again, our monitoring assurance role uh, is carried out through those sorts of reports. Um, we had the Audit New Zealand Management Report on the consultation document for the long-term plan. Uh, it was good to see that the Audit New Zealand summary statements were added to the plan and taken out for public consultation. Uh, so people could see what Audit New Zealand said about the plan and where um, they had any comment to make. Um, so th those are the main ones I want to talk about uh, at the moment, but we also had a risk appetite presentation from um, uh, the risk and assurance, the risk manager at Council. And we've been talking about risk appetite for some time around... Uh, tolerance for risk and how developing a framework to help inform decision making council wide is a really important um, process to have in place. The way we've been thinking about this recently is that we've been looking at particular areas and assessing the risk and determining what action we might need to take at an individual level. So you'll have seen that through your long-term planning process. Um, it helps us get, when we have the full framework, it helps us um, see where the tolerance for risk is across a whole range of council responsibilities. And it enables the council team to get on with some decisions within that framework. There will be a workshop coming up for all elected members around the risk appetite framework, but in the meantime, we are taking a progressive and iterative approach, 
as decisions and risks are identified to weighing up uh, the risks as we see them. And the next paper, or the next item on the agenda, the insurance one, is a really good example of how we're actually looking at the risk appetite and what we're prepared to make decisions on uh, when we think about insurance. I'm going to pause there because that's my verbal briefing on the meeting and I'll move if, oh, uh, if there are any questions or comments on any of that. Otherwise I'm going to move through to the insurance paper. Okay. Now we'll we'll, move, we'll uh, move through 8.4 because we yep. there are also opportunity for comments as well. So do we have any yep. questions around the table? Clarification? Okay, Councillor uh, Kate. It's not a question, it's a comment. Is that all right? Okay, no, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just, um, I, need, I, I want to, first of all, um, I'll put it this way, I'll move, um, if we've got no questions, uh, that, uh, before we get into comments, that the Council receive the Verbal Update Risk and Assurance Committee Chair's Update, May 2024. Do I have a seconder? Yes. Councillor Kate. Um, so, move on to comments, Councillor Kate. Uh, thank you, um, Ian, thanks to Susan for the report. Um, I wanted to make two comments. One is there is a workshop coming to town about risk appetite. Mm. It's a must do, in my view. So you're warmly welcome to come along to that workshop when, it, when it's scheduled. Number two, just in relation to item 5.8 of the risk and assurance meeting last Thursday, um, and it was item 5.8, the construction, health and something, health and safety, health and safety update. Yep. Um, as part of the discussion, I made the comment that I didn't feel where we were at with some items on that um, piece of work. I need to apologise because when I was reading my papers, I omitted to look at the, it was on page 115, and if you're interested, go have a look. Um, there is a very detailed um, uh, commentary on where we're at with each item in that um, that piece of work. So well worth having a look and yeah, I just wanted to formally apologise for um, making the observation that I didn't have a feel for where we were at and how we were prioritising those um, actions. So if the Chief Executive could pass that on to Olivia and I think Catherine is in charge of that bit of work too. Um, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Kate. Um, so, uh, look, um, I can't see any other comments, but I will uh, pass a, a brief comment. Um, I'm really uh, impressed with the um, uh, with with the updates we're getting and the the committee um, objectives for risk and assurance. And uh, so I want to say thank you, to Susan, for your work and also. Uh, for for those uh, uh, those council officers that also you um, you work with um, in that as well, you know I, I think risk and assurance is going to become a bigger and bigger item for councils, and it's more than just compliance. It actually helps us to understand our issues and opportunities for council, um, and to uh, if we if we're good risk managers, we're we're prudent in our dealings, um, and we're accountable uh, both. Uh, to our community, but also to ourselves as well. So, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with where things are at, and uh, and addressing some historical matters that have been on the table for a while um, is uh, it's great to see. So, thank you. Uh, so, uh, no further comments. Um, I'll put the motion on the screen that the uh, council receive the verbal update, risk and assurance committee chairs update, May 2024. All those in favour? All those against? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, so item 8.5, uh, this is, um, we've just mentioned this, uh, Susan, so insurance um, uh, moving from a tran uh, transactional uh, approach to a strategic approach for purchasing insurance. Thank you. Um, in line with this insurance strategy that we approved last year, and given the significant increase in insurance cover this year and what's predicted for 2024-25, this paper sets out the first step in changing the way council purchases insurance. It is indeed shifting from a transactional blanket approach 
to insurance to strategically looking at all our assets, their criticality, the risks in, a, in insuring or not, and the council's ability to self-insure or fund the loss. This paper provides the rationale for taking this approach, um, provides a number of options, and notes that this is the beginning of a process to review insurance cover for all assets. Further updates on progress and decision making required to fully implement this approach will be provided to risk and assurance at our meetings and we will bring further recommendations to the Council. The committee discussed and considered this paper in full and we thank Mike Furmore for his presentation on the paper. Uh, and the committee supports the recommendation to cancel the insurance cover for low-risk property assets as attached. We did have two um, subject to uh, um, issues as a result of our discussion, and one was around uh, communication uh, with the Pākai Tore uh, Trust Board around some of the assets that would not be insured if this decision were approved, um, and that has been done, is my understanding. And the second thing was that there was a, a note, uh, there was an inclusion on the attachment for the Spriggans Park changing sheds, which it was determined that we should remove from that low risk property asset list. And that has been done. So the asset list that you have with your paper, the low risk pro property assets, is what we're recommending that we cancel insurance on. The estimate of costs to be saved are around 102,000. Um, uh, that's an estimate because we, with the way we have uh, had our insurance paid for in the past, uh, we've had to estimate what that would be. It may be less than that. Uh, but that's the estimate at this stage. So it's a start to actually rigorously, uh, critically analyse what we're insuring and why, uh, and this is the start of a process. So I'll um, take the paper as read and happy to answer any other questions. Great. Thank you, Susan. For, uh, for those that were in attendance at the Risk and Assurance meeting, this was uh, well covered, uh, so it's an opportunity for... Um, any questions of clarification that might those that might not have been there? Um, Councillor, oh, Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure who completed the section on the uh, heritage assets, which is page 41. Um, and there was an assessment of that there were no Māori and cultural considerations in the report. And I'm really surprised at that. There are clearly, with the list that's being decided perhaps not to be insured, there are clearly some monuments that are on Paikatori which have clearly have Māori considerations and obviously cultural considerations with a lot of the assets that are being discussed today. I'm just wondering what sort of lens has been put over this item in respect to those. Okay. I'll pass over to Chief Executive. Uh, through you, Worship, I may invite Mr. Furmore to come and add to my answer, but this was discussed at the Risk and Assurance Committee. Um, the reason for that judgment there is because we're not actually debating whether or not uh, a monument that's destroyed in an insurable event should or should not be replaced. What we're deciding is, are we going to pay for insurance or are we going to self-insure it from our balance sheet? And in the context of the decision at hand, there isn't a cultural consideration. It's just about how do we pay for its replacement, not whether we should or should not replace it. Okay, thank you. Good answer. Thank you. Um, so one last question, Susan. Would have it been uh, possible or prudent, and I don't mean that in any other way than just what's one phrase in the question, 
to actually go back to the broker to find out if this would be, if we if we do agree to this today, that that they could confirm the amount that we'd be saving. Sure, I just I will would like Mike to answer that um, because he's been talking to the broker. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I have, uh, through the chair, I have um, shared this paper with the broker, just to so they've got eyes on the journey we're going through, um, confirming what, uh, David, these are low-risk assets. That is, what, what we mean by that, the chances of, of significant damage, which are in ex, uh, above our excesses, is very low. That's what we mean by low-risk assets, not that they're not critical assets. They're just low-risk as far as significant damage goes. I think Susan mentioned for a material damage policy, we give a schedule of assets and the dollar value of those assets, each asset, and they give us a total premium. We allocate that based on the proportion of the cost of the asset to the whole total. Now, the insurance people, this is their business, and they understand that the assets we're taking off are the low-risk assets. So we've given an indication of 102,000. It will be below that amount. In our mind, uh, as, as the risk insurance presented the risk insurance committee, this is a start of the journey, um, and there will be some significant decisions coming up on some assets, uh, some fairly high value assets and high risk assets, whether we insure or not. Any other questions, Helen? No. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter. Yes, first my apologies for not being at the last risk um, meeting assurance. So this may have already been covered in that, but in option three, the option encompasses numerous lists and bundles and the option will be explored in future reports. Is there a timeline on that? We will, um, we've got on our work program to receive an update every meeting uh, from now on uh, on um, progress and where the team have got to in um, looking at the assets. I think um, I might have sort of said at the next meeting will we get the next series of recommendations and Mike, yes, and Mike needs to really work with the team and to make sure that we're ready for that. But this... Um, this paper we met on Thursday, it was really important to me and to the team that we brought this to you as soon as possible so we can actually keep moving this along uh, to, to um, make sure that we are critically analysing our insurance before we get to the renewal in November. Cool. Thank you. Mike, yeah. Mike would like to add. Yeah. Sorry, just an uh, additional comment. Um, what um, you need to make some of those larger decisions is a framework on which you can base decisions. So what the team is working on at the moment is what a framework like that looks like. And at this stage, the plan is to, once we've developed that, um, is to run a workshop with the full council and the independence of the uh, Audit Risk Committee just to go through that framework um, what officers don't want to do is to go to a committee meeting and say, take this library off, take this sports stadium off. Um, you need to have had that discussion beforehand to understand that. Great. Any other questions, well, Councillor? Yeah. So in response to that, then surely you, we would be doing our, um, you know, our appetite for risk before that. Yes, that's exactly that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, cool. And and I think option three, when you refer to option three, it was really saying um, the option encompassed numerous lists or bundles of various what what we it was an option to sort of take a big uh, list of things. Uh, whereas we're saying let's do a stepped approach. Let's put this one up first. Yep. Yeah, yeah, fully understand. Yeah, Thank you. Fully. Uh, Councillor Philippa. Yeah, thank you. Um, just um, so, well, I'm not against the the way it's heading at all, but if I could just quick couple, two or three questions. Um, 
So in cultural assets, um, like 38 Taupo Key, the Sergeant on the Key leasehold improvements there, there was, you know, so there's two million odd of, I guess that's seen as um, value, you know, a lot of leasehold improvements. And I guess I'm just trying to understand, of course, we've, moved, we've exited that building. We, can you just, um, sorry, do we own the building or just the improvements? And it just seems, you know, worst case scenario, fire happens, what does it mean? I spoke with um, the uh, director of the sergeant today, Andrew, um, uh, particularly about this one here. Um, in a worst case scenario, if this, if the improvements burn down, we're actually in a new building fairly shortly, we're not going to reinstate. Um, we don't own the building, we have um, done the improvements, we have some obligations in that building to put it to a certain order before we exit. Um, I will be, before I advise that run through to Ion, I will just ensure those contractual obligations um, that this is not undermining any of those contractual obligations. Right, so, sorry, presumably a lot of those lease, well, there was, there would be permanent ones, but like some of those leasehold improvements are moving to the sergeant, um, the shelving or whatever you want to call that. But anyway, that's a pr probably comment, comment more. Um, sports facilities, Cooks Gardens infrastructure, kind of 2.4 million. We see in the big list, obviously the velodrome's not in this list, you know, the vela, you're just talking about the infrastructure, but from what I can see, what is that infrastructure? Because you're not including the velodrome. Uh, uh, you're not trying to not ensure that at this stage in this, um, or the grandstands, Cooks Gardens, or the, yeah, the function centre. So is this the running track, for example? And I mean, it's, it's how, a bit of risk, how, quite a bit of risk there of that being ripped up and damaged by, you'd hope not, by, but. So, so the, um, for our, for our assets on this policy, we, we do what we component, componentize each of the assets, which means for some of these major assets, which are, you know, multi-million dollars, we go down to very uh, low level of, of breakdown of those. These particular improvements here, you're talking about some of the concrete pathways, you're talking about some of the concrete steps up to the entranceways, so it's those those components of the Cooks Gardens facility um, that are low risk as far as an event goes. So as I said, it's mainly the, per the, the concrete structures, entranceways, things like that. So not the running track, because that's I, I don't believe worth so, about no. a million dollars or so. Um, and last one is the skate bowl, Seafront Road, over half a million dollars. Uh, again, this is coming back to the type of event uh, that would damage these assets to such an extent um, that we would be um, claiming insurance, of, which is above our excess, uh, currently sits at $100,000. And for these assets here, some of these really uh, almost permanent structures, if these assets are completely destroyed, then uh, basically the whole Wong is gone. Uh, you're talking about, sorry, I'm not trying to be provocative here, but you're talking about a very significant earthquake that would damage a number of these assets. The likely thing would perhaps be intentional damage, uh, which is more than likely to be under our excess. Thank you. Hi, um, Councillor Ross. Yeah, thank you. Um, this may wind up going to the CE. Um, Motor Gardens, there's a number of statues. Rightly or wrongly, I was under the impression that our obligation was the maintenance of the public toilet there and under the agreement and the rest was Motua Gardens. But this is suggesting obviously that the statues we were insuring, is that that's part of the agreement and that what we're saying now is that's coming off. So we actually have more of an involvement in Motua Gardens than I originally thought. Is that correct? Um, can, I, can I just um, suggest that it's, uh, you refer to Pakai Tore, um, um, is my, my understanding. I'm not sure whether it makes any difference or not, but that's... No, it's a good point. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, just Pakai Tore, that's what you mean. Pakai Tore, so, yeah. Mm. Yep, great. So, um, is that question... Can I make a comment on that? Uh, sure. Uh, in, in your role, yeah. um, Josh? Yes. 
Yes, so the, um, the, the monuments have uh, for some time, I'm not sure, sure how long, but for some time been included on council's um, <clears throat> insurance policy. Uh, when this came forward to the Risk and Assurance Committee the other day, I specifically requested that Mike um, do me up an email that I can pass on to the board um, for further discussion. I've had nothing come back. Uh, the, the question, I guess, for the board in future is whether it wants to go to uh, Heritage New Zealand to request some other form of insurance policy, given that those monuments are actually under the custodianship of Heritage New Zealand rather than the board itself. Um, but that's a conversation for the board to have. Um, it doesn't relate to, to this issue. Okay. You with that? Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, okay, Councillor Kate is moved. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Jenny, right. So no further questions. So um, do we have any uh, comments? Uh, Deputy Mayor Helen. Uh, th thank you. Uh, look, I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, Audit and Risk Committee for taking on this extra bit of work uh, along with their finance team. Um, I do support it in the intent, and I will support this motion, but I, I have got some reservations around the Māori and cultural assets. And that is based on the real big risk is uh, to me, that I, I see as the earthquake risk. So that would be a large event that could potentially wipe out or d seriously damage a lot of our monuments. I've had it t talked before that we are the monument capital of New Zealand and we are pretty well endowed with them and the thing is they are pretty special, a lot of them. They are quite unique and the uh, cultural significance to, um, to Whanganui is absolutely huge. Um, and I'm just, a, and my, my caution comes from Yes, if they were totally destroyed, would you ever try and rebuild them exactly as they are? Quite possibly not. That's always a judgment call at the time, depending on how much money you've got. And of course, if you don't have insurance, you've got nothing to play with. We currently have a public art fund of $30,000, and that doesn't get you very far. Um, I'm also aware that a recent study uh, suggested on earthquake uh, risk suggested that there will be uh, a... Um, a, not an, a nine Richter scale earthquake in the next 50 years, there's a t about a 25% chance of that happening. And that would be on the more of the, our neighbouring area on the right of Wanganu, if you're looking at New Zealand maps. It's a, pr it's a pretty big one. It's massive. And it would no doubt affect us. So obviously you've got your earthquake mm. risk and you've got liquefaction. So that's where the caution for me comes. If you mm. have no insurance, you're effectively self-insuring. It could be a large event. And, and where would we be in terms of those cultural assets? Because it would probably be the last thing that we all have the energy and, and, and thought to think about would be replacing those. So that's just what's on my mind. And um, this is a very difficult decision, uh, only from the point of view, for me, of those particular assets. But uh, at the end of the day, if we have to find savings, you've got to start somewhere. And um, it is one risk, no, it's not uh, including fire and all that, because that's unlikely to be an issue here, so reluctantly support it. I would just like to say that I, I really hope that, you know, that this decision wouldn't go ahead if at the end of the day the insurers said, well, actually, the risk on those things are so low, you're going to save only a few thousand dollars. You know, it would just be, to me, not value for what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Glenda. Thank you. Just want to say thank you for all the work that's gone into this. It's great to hear the in-depth analysis that's, um, you know, that's been put against the things that you think you know, we, we could drop the insurance cover on. I think um, everybody that owns a business at the moment in this environment is probably looking at the insurance costs to try and um, decrease the overheads, and we just have to make the tough call sometimes. So just want to give, um, pass on my thanks to you all for this, for this work. And I have, a, I have assurance in the Assurance Committee that you're doing a great job. Thank you. Councillor Michael. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to repeat some of my 
spew that I did in the risk insurance meeting and how happy I was. Spew? Spew? Speak? Spiel. That's what I meant. Spiel. Apologies, the table. Um, <laughs> Risk and insurance meeting, I was so happy to see this because when you think about what is insurance, you tend to get into this fear receptor of I cannot afford to replace items, therefore I need insurance. Uh, these insurance companies make money. They are a profit-making company. And when we think about what the council is, we can lend money a lot lower than these insurance companies do. So I was really happy with the low risk items. Uh, when we take into consideration the maximal probable loss and the expected an annual return, um, the, the million dollars we spend every year on insurance, reducing that by a small amount is a good first step, Mike. I like to replace the whole thing, but that's just me. Um, but yeah, looking forward to seeing where this goes and how it, this is a good first step to look at low value items that we will self insure and move forward from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you to the team that are doing this work. It's really important when the rest of the organisation is looking for savings in all sorts of places mm. that we do our bit and that we find some savings too. Um, that said, this paper for me is about using the weight of our balance sheet to actually self-insure. Um, it's not about cultural considerations because um, uh, in, in, an, in a massive event, I would expect, yes, um, infrastructure will be the first considerations, but equally importantly, I would hope that the wisdom um, that prevails when we come to replacing council um, assets is that cultural considerations are hugely important, art considerations, um, especially after a, um, a, a big event. You know, look at Christchurch and look at... Um, the discussion and the passion that's gone into things like replacing the Christ Christchurch Cathedral, etc. Anyway, good paper, well done, thanks for the work. Right, thank you. Councillor Ross. Yes, I also want to congratulate you on the document because we heard earlier today in, a, in a, a workshop about the cost of roading, sewerage, insurance and so on, and I think for the public's benefit, we, the Council, your committee is moving very, very quickly to notice that the insurance costs have gone through the roof and we're moving very, very quickly to figure out what assets we can reduce the insurance on or which would not be viable to continue insurance on. So from a ratepayers' point of view, congratulations that you're moving so quickly to help reduce the burden on ratepayers in this area. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Josh. Yeah, look, I mean, when the, when, the, when the likely cost of the damage is, is less than um, the cost of the deductible, then it makes sense to save money going forward um, on premiums. And I'm glad that we've had two goes at this because it was a really good discussion the other day at the Risk and Assurance Committee, and um, this is just logical to me. Um, the, the case has been very well made, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'll um, just... Uh close this off by saying that to this to me is a risk and insurance committee in action, balancing uh, pragmatism um, and the reality of, uh, of, of where, where things are at in the insurance world. So uh, congratulations um, for that and um, thanks for uh, this, this paper. Uh, so look, um, there are no uh, further um, comments, so I will put the motion on the screen. Um, for 8.5 insurance, moving from a transactional approach to a strategic approach for purchasing insurance. And I'll read it out in full. The Risk and Insurance Committee recommends that the Council cancels insurance cover on those assets identified in the attachment low risk property assets contained within the report insurance, moving from the transactional approach to the, a strategic approach for purchasing insurance presented to the 2 May 2024 Risk and Assurance Committee meeting, subject to officers completing the necessary communication and analysis. All those in favour? All those against? Motion is carried. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, and moving on to item 8.6, the Wanganui Regional Museum Emergency Funding Request, May 2024. Um, so... Uh, I'm not sure who's going to, I presume the papers are read, but um, 
Are you going to talk to this, uh, David, or? Uh, yes, I have a okay. Uh, through you, Worship, uh, if I may, I'd like to invite uh, Bronwyn and Marshall just to come up and join the table. Um, they're here to speak to the report as uh, representatives of the museum. Uh, but uh, by way of a very brief introduction from me, uh, uh, Council received a request for financial assistance from the museum uh, just a little while ago. Um, we've prepared this report to give you the option uh, to approve that request, uh, but I won't go into too much detail. I'm going to hand over now to uh, to Bronwyn and Marshall uh, so that they can talk to their request. Yeah. Good afternoon, Bronwyn, and good afternoon, Marshall. Uh, welcome to uh, Council Chambers. Tina <laughs> For the opportunity to come and share the, uh, our submission to the council, um, we've been here a couple of times over the past four or five years, and I suppose it's come to a time where we've uh, needed to come with some urgency to 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 the council and when uh, uh, Bronwyn and I met with uh, uh, the CE and the Mayor in a meeting how to progress the museum forward. So uh, I'll leave it like that and we could just get into things from here and happy to be involved with the conversation or answer any questions as we go along. All right. Right, thank you. Um, thank you, Marshall. Right, so... Um, Could I just say kia ora koutou as well. Um, it's great to be here. And I'd just like to acknowledge that Carla Donson is here as our chair of the Electoral College. So she's here in support and we have some board members watching the live stream avidly as well. <laughs> and I'd um, also like to acknowledge that you are having a very long meeting and you've had uh, a lot of serious issues to discuss. So we're really grateful that you're giving time um, to hear our plea. And I would just add that the bullet points in the paper acknowledge what the issues are for us, which are similar to lots of other cult cultural institutions, general inflationary pressures, um, every consumable we consume, like every other organisation and household is going up in price. Uh, we have been, despite strenuous efforts, unable to fundraise the difference. <laughs> Um, we have also had a bit of a hiccup with some uh, payments and um, we have a, a program of repaying um, some debts to the IRD as well, which you need to understand about. Um, and I understand some extra information went to you yesterday, so I'm also happy to answer questions about that. But this is a shortfall until we get to the end of the financial year. Um, and, of course, in the new financial year, we're also most grateful that the um, funding of the museum is being increased um, in the, under the long-term plan. So I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. Kia ora. Okay. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. And welcome to Carla in the back there. All right. So uh, do we have any questions of clarification? I see Councillor Josh. Thank you. Thank you both for being here today. Um, just one question from me uh, to begin with anyway. Uh, around the IRD payments, can you talk to us about what mitigations have been put in place since that issue came to light and since you went on to a repayment plan um, to ensure that there are, there are more checks and safeguards going into the future? I mean, I understand it will be part of the 17A review as well, no doubt, but, but for now it would be good to understand that more. 
Yes, and that, that's an absolutely um, good and essential question. Uh, we have changed the um, arrangements around the login to the portal and who's reporting. We have also changed uh, accountants since that event came to light, and the new accountant is working closely with IRD on the payment, the pay, payment plan, um, and then we've got more checks and balances, um, and that the Joint Council is across what's happening much more closely. That has come up in a previous audit, and we've been responding to the audit recommendations as well. So those changes, are they, are they purely operational, or have there been policy reviews as well around financial management processes and such? Uh, they're mostly operational, but we are reviewing policy as well at the moment under the new accountant particularly. So they're, they're going hand in hand. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Michael. Um, yeah, so regarding the cash flow projections, when you say to get to the 30th 06, 24, what's going to change after that, seeing as these numbers don't add up either? So I'm wondering, is it going to be a quarterly amount of money that's required each time? Definitely not. I would not be happy if we had to resort to that situation. Um, there are several things I think that are changing. One is a slight increase in the funding from the council. The second is the review that is going to be undertaken. Uh, the third is uh, more work around fundraising and generating revenue, plus the operational and policy things to support that. So um, we do have a number of uh, work streams around that underway. And that's to cover the 44% deficit per month? Are you meaning until the end of the financial year? or? Yeah, are but these are, ongoing, these are ongoing monthly expenses that equal 44% deficit each month. But if we have more income, sorry, I don't quite follow you. If we have more so, income... So it's, it's based on the prelude that there's 44% more income coming in a month. Because that's not what the resolution is. The resolution is to one-off payment. But actually, you're after 44% increase. Can, can I just clarify, but where did you get 44% from? Are these your own calculations, Michael? For the cash flow projections on David's email, yeah. um, the standardised uh, expenses going out every month with the standardised incoming fees every month, there is a roughly $47,000 every quarter, sorry, every quarter. Okay, can I, I'm just going to pass over to our Chief Executive to respond to the query and maybe help clarify. Yeah. Uh, through your worship, if I may, the, the figures that were forwarded to you uh, yesterday evening are the cash flow needs to see the museum to the end of the financial year and maintain solvency. Included in there is um, clearing some of the, the debts that are owed to the IRD. Um, so they are one-off um, liabilities that won't reoccur um, the subsequent year. Um, and you are probably looking at some timing issues here around where costs are falling because if you think about it, this is a up to a $250,000 payment for the full year on a budget of um, about $1.1 million. So as a percentage of the, the full year's worth of budget, it's significantly less than 44%. Yep. Just to clarify, I'm only taking into consideration the monthly average bills and the PAYE. I'm not taking into consideration the yearly interest or the IRD or the insurance or anything I should pro rata over a month. I'm just literally taking those and there's still a deficit, which means there would be needed to be more money three, in three months after this. Yeah, so again, um, through your worship, I should probably have covered this in my introduction with just a little bit of detail. The, um, this funding, um, when the request came into council, we had a discussion with the museum around um, how do we how do we deal with the short term but then also how do we deal with the long-term implications of the funding of the museum so short term we need to help them get to the end of the financial year to maintain solvency longer term we need to make some fundamental or systemic changes that mean that we don't get back here this time next year um, 
we'd already anticipated some of that through the long-term plan, which is why the proposal is to increase the museum's funding. But this is also then where the Section 17A service delivery review comes in, so that we can effectively take a, a, a root and branches review of the museum, both from a, a governance, a funding and financing, and a service delivery model point of view. And then based on that, you'll be in a position for us to work with the museum to, to identify what change is needed to ensure that the museum is financially sustainable in the long run. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, Councillor Rob. Thank you, thank you. Um, just the, uh, with the um, PAYE and GST, it, it's a bit, bit frightening to read that, that it, this occurred. Um, so can you just give us some idea, um, was this purely a cash flow issue that this occurred? Or was there some sort of uh, human error here? Thank you for that question too. Um, it is horrifying. Um, so I sit here before you feeling uh, quite a lot of embarrassment and uncomfortableness. Mm. Um, it was, I think, a bit of both. So the previous accountant thought that the IRD had made errors and the IRD hadn't. And then, then, then there was a question of whether all the communication between the IRD and the accountant was happening in a timely fashion. And I think that's the, one of the other things that happened. Uh, we were horrified as soon as we learnt the extent of it. And was this a, an internal accountant or external accountant? Uh, point of order, Mr Mayor. Yeah. I'm not sure about the, the um, point of this questioning. I think it's a very valid point. Yeah, it was well covered the, the Section 17A right. review will sort it. Okay, I'm, um, I'm, um, yeah, I need to make a ruling on this. So um, I'm satisfied that 17A review will address any deficiencies in services provided to the museum, including the accountant. So point of order is upheld. upheld. Okay. Um, right, so Councillor uh, Jenny. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarification, probably to the CE. I did request the up to 250 to be added in there, but it says approves a one off payment. I'm presuming that this is a payment on a monthly basis, not, not one payment, but various payments, but this is a one off opportunity. Uh, through your worship, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Kate. Just a wee question, and it's more in relation to the nature of the payment, or the up to payment. Is this grant funding, or is it a loan? Through you, uh, your worship, at this uh, point in time, the intent is that it is a grant. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter. Yeah, in regards to the review, is there a timeline when it will be completed? Over to the Chief Executive. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I suppose, uh, apologies, I should probably have added a little bit of additional context to the answer to my previous question, and I'll come on to Councillor Peters. Um, given the, given the, the Council is the primary funder of... Um, the museum making this funding alone um, seems a little bit fruitless seeing as though we would be funding the museum to repay the loan to ourselves, hence why we went for the grant option, uh, just to be clear on that one. Uh, the timeline for the review, so the, the review, because we're required to do these things every six years anyway, has already been commissioned and has just started. Uh, the intent is that all things being equal, it should be completed by the end of the financial year. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you. Um, item B, that the Whanganui Museum would be bound to implement the subsequent decisions of council um, it is the trust that runs the museum at the moment, and they're fully aware of that clause. 
uh, through your worship um, by way of explanation first of all yesterday we had some queries from some elected members and I'm proposing a, a small amendment to the resolution um, the museum are aware of the council's requirements in terms of undertaking the review and being bound to to implement whatever comes out of the other side the change in wording is just to be really explicit as it was about um, being bound to the decisions that council make off the back of the review given that the council is the the primary funder of the museum the in my understanding from conversations with marshall and bromwin was that that's acceptable uh, but I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves if you want to. Don't need to respond, but if you'd like to. Yeah. Um, we'll just say yes, we do understand that, and that is what everyone is comfortable with at the moment. All right. Uh, Councillor Philippa. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, two questions. I didn't... Sorry, just trying to understand that second resolution as well. I didn't quite understand. Maybe I missed a bit. Um, but so, so is that meaning in the end that the museum understands and is agreeable um, that post this, if these resolutions go through, that they will be bound to implement subs the, the decisions of council, what kind of whatever those decisions are, I guess is my question. Is that correct? Are we talking financial? We're talking operational governance? We're talking the whole gambit? Yeah. So, um, through your worship, I think if we lift it up a level, the intent of this part of the resolution is that council isn't just simply handing over uh, a significant sum of money to the museum and then walking away. The second part of the resolution binds uh, the museum to taking action. So once we've done the review, if there are, is a, an identified need to make changes, then those changes will get made. So that, again, the intent is we don't simply end up back here again in another 12 months time or however long it takes uh, with a further request for additional funding. So thank does that you. make sense? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, my second question uh, just, I guess, is around the first um, resolution. Um, reading through the report, the reviews estimated cost thirty six thousand. Um, that's been unbudgeted expenditure approved by the chief executive. So, is that inclusive? Is that two fifty thousand inclusive of the thirty six, or are we talking? Should that, for ex if we're going to be explicit, I'm thinking it's not part of the up to two fifty. I'm thinking the thirty six thousand is unbud. Well, that it's it's more grant funding, and should we that resolution not be changed to up to two hundred and eighty six thousand? No, through you, Worship. Um, the, my interpretation of the accountant's report that I've received from the museum, plus the cash flow forecast that they've provided to us, the 250K um, ought to be slightly more than is needed, hence why it's up to. Um, there's still opportunities to, for the museum to negotiate with the IRD to, to um, reduce some of the penalty payments associated with the, the repayment. That would bring the sum down further. So that is why uh, the resolution has been amended to say up to. Uh, the $250,000 is also the sum that the museum requested from council, rather than it being a number that me or my team has, has made up. But does it include, where, where does the 36,000 that's already been approved by yourself, where does that sit? Does it sit outside oh, of that? So, through you, Your Worship, the $36,000 is a cost to council. It's not funding to the museum. As under the, under the Local Government Act, we have to do Section 17A service delivery reviews. It is our responsibility because the museum, whilst it's in a separate trust, is still an activity of council as far as our long-term plan is is concerned so therefore it is um, it's an obligation on us to fund the review process because it's a core part of our compliance with the act thank you okay, okay. councillor kate move councillor charlie second so any comments on this item councillor josh quick off the mark today Oh, um, 
nothing of any real substance to say, actually. Um, I just wanted to... <laughs> I just wanted to talk. Yeah, you did it earlier. You did it earlier. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to note that I'm, that I'm satisfied with the process, with the 17A uh, review, <laughs> um, and that... I was going to say something else. Now you've all distracted me. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Marshall um, and Bronwyn, for presenting today. Uh, look, this is a, a, a sobering paper, and I know that you take this very seriously, um, and it is not a situation that, uh, that anybody would want to find themselves in. Um, but can I just say, uh, you know, this is our museum. It is not somebody mm. else's. It's not a trust, you know, museum. No matter what structure was set up at some point, this is our museum, and it needs to be supported properly. And I'm really pleased that the Section 17A Service Review will really establish uh, what has not only gone on, but what should we put in place in future and how we can best support it. This museum is loved by this community, and I think that the museum um, management and, 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 and the... Uh, the, um, the the board the as such have ha, have really you know provided a fantastic facility that we can be incredibly proud of um, so none of that changes this is like the back room that needs some sorting out and I'm really pleased that it, that we're here today and that's that's moving forward so thank you, thank you. Uh, councillor Michael thank you mayor um, I'll be the the meanie then in the room. This isn't about the museum to me at all. The, the museum is wonderful. The, it's got some amazing things and I go there regularly. Um, this is a process that the board has failed to come to the council at an appropriate time, failed to provide the sufficient amount of information that I can make a critical decision on the emergency funding. I see okay, no- Sorry, I'd have to have a point of order there. Um, which one? So the board have failed. The, the board have failed to come to the council. Uh, we had, um, if I could respond to that, um, of course you can. Uh, we had uh, Bronwyn come to us some time ago, uh, as early as she could, uh, to represent the council, whether it was the board or management, uh, to highlight uh, some impending issues with their financial situation. Which I would, if I was to further comment, is not just common to our own museum, but museums across the country. And uh, it's a challenge for all museums across the country right now, I would imagine. So I believe that you came as quickly as you could. So, Okay, I will take that back then, because you can't make a decision on your own point of order, I'm assuming. Um, <laughs> and I'll rephrase it, that our leadership didn't come to the councillors quickly enough. Uh, you were there. Point of order. Okay, timeline. Timeline. Okay. All right. Uh, could, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm timeline. Gonna to, I'm going to have to ask you to. Um, I'm going to ask you to come back, Michael, uh, Councillor Michael, to comment later. But just reflect on the comments because they haven't oh. been accurate so far. I'm happy for you to. They are comment. extremely accurate. I was the chair when they last. Okay, so sorry. Um, All right. Yep. So. Um, yeah, so um, I'm ha very happy for you to come in, comment later. Right? Um, but uh, but I, I, I want to, um, I don't want to have an argument in here about, about what was said and what wasn't said. That was at my recollection, um, and uh, if, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be challenged on it. Yeah, I, no, my sentiment and my sense around the room is that uh, my, I'm not wrong, um, but I'm very happy for you to comment on, on, on other items um, going forward. So, um, so moving forward, uh, Councillor Ross. Oh. Thank you, Chair. I just want to make a put its comments. This museum operates under a bicultural governance. It is bicultural in its operations, and it holds many ta'onga on behalf of iwi and hapu. We don't own the collection. We own the museum, but not the collection. We are entrusted to look after the ta'onga in that building, and we, are, we have, and we are, and we will continue to do so. For those who saw TV recently, Nearly all the museums and galleries in the country are at critical mass point. Ours is at that point where it needs a bit of support. 
when when the officers from the museum became aware there was a problem, they acted immediately and engaged council in conversations. I was part of that, as was Deputy Mayor Helen Craig, as was Carla, um, as chair of the Electoral um, College. So there's no blame. It is what it is, and it was timely brought to our attention, and we've dealt with it. It's unfortunate it's called a regional museum because we totally, we largely fund it. And I want to make the point here that it's the only museum in the country that I'm aware of that the education department funds a full-time education officer. The museum is grossly understaffed by at least four vacancies that I'm aware of. They are not backfilling. In fact, they're not even maintaining or moving forward. They are actually slipping back with, from where they need to be, just at, at, at basic operational level. So this is very timely for us to step in, and the Section uh, 17A will clarify for us what those recommendations are and what council's decisions may be. And, and I would like to leave it at that as I support this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Andrew. Um, I, I am going to support this. I've, I've given this considerable thought over the last week or so and asked for numerous amendments to the original recommendations based on it. Um, and the reasons I'm able to support it, one is I'm, I'm very passionate about the museum, but two, there is a new accountant, and that to me is very significant. I'm not sure I could support this with the previous regime, and the fact that the 17A review, which will come to us, um, is binding on the museum, and we've heard that the museum board is acceptable with that. Um, I, I think that the timing is really unfortunate. We have heard over time that there's been budget shortfall um, struggles, but we haven't had the museum come <coughs> to us with a clear cash flow that says, until now, and only at my request might I add, have we kept, had a cash flow that says how this has come about and how bad it is. And I do think, going back to um, Councillor Michael's point, we should have had this a long time ago and then we could have worked out this a long time ago because now we're looking down the barrel of, I'm pretty sure that some won't be 250K, it'll be less than that, but the timing is really bad given all the hard work that we've put in over the last many, many, many months to reduce budgets within council. Um, for those listening in to this um, live stream, I think it's important for people to note that this is not going to affect next year's budget this is out of cash flow or loans for this year, which um, won't affect the, any increase in rates at all. So, well, uh, marginal. So um, on that basis, I will support. Thank you. Councillor Rob. <coughs> Thank you, Worship. Um, yes, I too am, am certainly going to support this emergency funding of 250,000. I think it needs to be highlighted here how great this, this uh, museum, the Trust Board, have done for this community in keeping the cost to what it has done, especially over the last five years. Um, if you look back there in our notes, it says that 9.4% uh, um, increase over a period of five years against a CPI of 22%. That's indicative. That's why they're in the position they are today. And I place no blame for that on either the staff or the, the, the board. I think we've got to recognise that the board are there as volunteers. They're there like, as volunteers like others are in this community, and I thank you for that, and, and, and I recognise that. And um, while no one is happy about another 250,000, mm -hmm. I'm pleased that we have recognised in the LTP that this institution needs more money, needs more funding, and it has been increased. Thank you. Councillor Charlotte. Thank you. Um, much like uh, Councillor Rob, I just want to thank the board, uh, Andrew Bronwyn, for, um, for sitting in quite a difficult situation um, and for continuing in your roles um, through it. Um, and Long may it last. Councillor Philippa. 
Yeah, just briefly, I, I want to, I mean, you know, this, uh, it, 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 this is very bad timing. We know that. I mean, it's always bad timing, needing more money. It's very bad timing in a cost of living crisis. We have many, we, we, ha we know we do, there's many in our community struggling to pay, um, well, to have their own homes, but then paying mortgages, et cetera. And there'll be other people that are in situations where they may, um, you know, are having problems with IRD, et cetera. So I just want to put that out there. So this is not done easily. Um, I want to really thank the museum leadership for coming here. Um, I want to thank them for what they do in the community. Uh, you know, I think that um, out of this very unfortunate decision um, situation and the decisions that we're about to make, you know, good will come. So, you know, I, you know, I actually really um, believe there'll be some positive change for for the museum and for our community and opportunities and for the and um, with the service level review. Um, and I guess um, I look forward to that. Great, thank you. Uh, so look, I'll just finish off with the, the comments here. Um, I'm going to quote Adele Fitzpatrick, who's the CEO of Museums Aotearoa. I actually know Adele, uh, funnily enough, but um, she said uh, from our, I quote her, from our national museum to council operated museums and galleries to partially funded and completely unfunded, all are facing increasing pressure. Smaller provincial volunteer run organisations are particularly affected, but even our larger metropolitan institutions are facing an uncertain future. Costs are climbing for institutions as well as councils and there's simply less money to go around. Roading and water infrastructure make places livable, but she says arts and culture make it a great place to live. What the research revealed was an overworked uh, workforce, uh, overly reliant on volunteers, snowboarding costs and shrinking funding, small museums and galleries in the provinces and rural communities are barely being propped up by the community goodwill. So uh, that I think says it all and, and I want, the point I'm trying to make is that this is not just Whanganui. Uh, and what I do is I see a bunch of hard-working um, uh, uh, trustees and, um, uh, and, a, and a chief executive and staff and, and others involved in governance and, man and operations doing the best you can in a very tough situation right across the country. So um, that's what I'm saying on the matter. So I'm happy to support this. So look, uh, no further comments. I'll put the motion on the screen uh, that, Wanganui, that the council approves uh, a approves a one-off payment up up to 250,000 to the Wanganui Regional Museum so that it can maintain solvency up to 30 June 2024. B makes the additional funding conditional on the council undertaking a Section 17A service delivery review and the Wanganui Regional Museum being bound to implement the subsequent decisions of council. All those in favour? All, right. All those against? Councillor Michael. Okay. Uh, motion is carried. Um, so, look, it's 2.30. Uh, we are going to have to take, I know it's a, um, we're going to have to take a 15-minute adjournment um, uh, for um, our Chief Executive has to go for 15 minutes, and so, um, uh, so uh, yeah, that's all right. So he's got a, a commitment that he alerted me to right, right at the start of the day, so that's okay. Right. Can I yeah. Uh, through your worship, just by way of explanation, I was just going to step out of the meeting and allow you to continue in my absence. However, the officers for the next papers have, have just indicated their apologies to me, and you'd only have a very junior staff member talking to the report. I'd like to be back here to support them, um, so I apologise for the disruption. Yeah, that's, that's fine, actually. I was pondering that, so I was determined to think, make a decision on the fly, and I failed to do that. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, sorry, just, um, it looks like we, yeah, so do, do you have a... Kia ora, I just wanted to, um, and Marshall and I and Carter just wanted to uh, say thank you to everyone and how much we appreciate your support of the museum. And it's really good to have these kinds of discussions and to hear all your different thoughts. So we're really very grateful. Thank you. Kia ora. Great, right, thank you. Uh, so I'll take all that back. So we'll, we'll go to, if you're happy, uh, David, to go to item 8.11, Rural Community Board Chairs Update. Yes. Is that okay? Yes, I'm not. Oh, is it eight? So I, I really appreciate this. Oh, which number is it? An accident some years ago, and I never sorry, really sorry, got just, over just, it. Sorry, just uh, sorry, pause for a moment. Um, 
So yeah, I, would, so I, I appreciate being able to speak now, and uh, that that would that would be good. Okay, great, fantastic. <coughs> okay, so I'll, um, so so we're just uh, for those on the on camera, we've um, moved uh, to item eight. It was eight point one one rural community board chairs update. Uh, that the council received the report, rural community boards chair update May 2024. So over to you. I would take the, uh, so um, over to you, David, just to comment briefly if you like. Okay, thank you. Um, the rural community board has done a bit of work on long-term plan submissions for both Horizons and <coughs> our own long-term plan. So you will probably, I think, well, I think I did it, and hopefully I ticked the right box. And so I probably uh, Brian Doughty and I will probably appear here. Um, to speak to our submissions. Um, so the other, the, there's two issues that I want to go over. One is the rural halls. <coughs> uh, the Fordell earthquake strengthening is underway. And you may recall we had a brief discussion on it as part of the long-term plan workshops <coughs> and we, uh, we didn't get agreement for any extra assistance for this project um, from ratepayers in the long-term plan. Um, but Fordell, um, it was actually the Halls Committee, did manage to get 40,000 <coughs> of outside funding, so this project has been able to proceed. And the other comments I would make, uh, oh, <coughs> and then we go into the Yupak, Yupakanaru Hall, I had an approach from um, Caroline Gray from the UPUC community, and she is keen to get their hall up and running <coughs> again. It's in, a, it's in a pretty significant state of disrepair. Council, um, <coughs> to give credit, had done a lot of work in establishing what is required to get this building up to specification. And a year or so ago, when they completed that study, the cost they came up with, with was 1.9 million. <coughs> um, and so I've had another call from Caroline this morning, and she is doing a lot of work attempting to find out what support there is in that community to try and get this building reinstated. It's going to be quite a mission because there is no ratepayer <coughs> funding yet allocated for it. I, th I think that they may be going to submit to the long-term um, plan hearings on that. And the, I think Helen has suggested that they get some sort of change to their heritage status. And that may, if they achieve that, they may that may get, <coughs> make it easy for them to find um, <coughs> other funding. Um, so there's two, I was interested in the insurance discussion we've just had. Uh, a big portion of, of what council allocates to these rural halls goes in insurance. So we're just wondering whether there might be um, some synergy if we can perhaps include that situation with the work <coughs> the council is doing and ensuring its other assets. I had a quick chat to Susan. She said that uh, might be appropriate. So perhaps if you'd keep that in mind. Um, one of the comments that was made when I brought the Fordell Hall situation up was um, <coughs> that they um, didn't think it appropriate that the 40,000 I suggested to help with the earthquake strengthening should go ahead on the basis that you only knew about it because I happened to be a trustee. Um, so I'm just wondering whether I failed to mention that the uh, trust deed for the rural halls stipulates that there be three community board elected members on that trust. So that uh, is why you're starting to hear about these things uh, from me because uh, that's why I'm a trustee. Um, the, the other thing that I'm, because I've had to go right through the long-term plan, I just, it occurred to me that there's an enormous disparity 
between what the ratepayer provides for Marais of the proposal is 500,000 a year, large disparity there between what rural halls are allocated, which is 75,000 a year. So I, I just make that point. Uh, it, it's up to you to um, decide whether or not you think that's a relevant comparison. But I just thought I'd, make, I'd use this opportunity to point that out. Uh, so the only other um, rural um, comment I'll make is we did a s survey a little while ago uh, and the questions we asked are the, what are the issues that the rural people would like our board to um, prioritise? And one of them was connectivity. So, I, and of course, council in the long-term plan is proposing to not have a resource um, <laughs> dedicated to that. Um, so I just thought, it, it, but it obviously is still an issue. I was sort of working on the basis that if you couldn't get Inspire broad, uh, Wi-Fi broadband, you just hooked up a Starlink uh, and away you went. And, um, and the, the comment I will make about Starlink now is they it used to be 150, 160 a month, but now they have a $79 a month option. It's an extremely good set, but way better than um, normal uh, wireless broadband. <coughs> um, so it is now a particularly good option. But, but it's actually, the issue goes further than that because I've also realised that within the next few years, the intention is to completely get rid of all copper wire services. And the rural people are reluctant to move away from their landlines uh, on the copper wire because they keep those landline services keep running when the power goes off. And so people are very nervous about uh, <coughs> having a power cut and no communications. But there are actually plenty of ways around that. So I, <coughs> so it will be a focus for our board because I think we can help promote <coughs> a number of um, <coughs> ways of getting around um, that particular issue. Um, I, and I, I note that Saturday delivery to rural areas is going. So that means most of our rural communities will not get a newspaper on a Saturday if they're still getting a hard copy delivered. But my view is that people like us should be getting it digitally anyway. <coughs> so I think we've got some work to do there. Um, the other common co um, suggestion we get or complaint we get is the limited cell phone um, availability in the rural regions. So the point I make there is that there have been significant improvements. The para, para I understand, is quite well serviced now. There's been another two, apparently, cell phone sites. So Helen might know. But I, I think you can get most of the way between here and Radahi with quite good cell phone service now. Mm. Um, places like Kaiwi, far now, we still get parts of those areas are very poor. So we need to find out a way of <coughs> advocating to improve that. Um, so yes, so that covers yeah that that covers the notes I've made on the rural situation at the moment and uh, <coughs> and the things that our board will um, <coughs> start working on. Although of course. Uh, with the representation review, <laughs> we haven't even been guaranteed that there will be a board beyond the next 18 months anyway. Um, so we have had an input into that. <coughs> and I understand that the proposal that is going to council will include a, a rural community board <coughs> being part of it. So, uh, and you will get to vote on that. So. <laughs> So um, my view is that 
we have a role and I would be most appreciative if you could would consider voting for what I think is going to be the option that will be recommended. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, great. No. Um, okay, so look, um, are there any questions from, I see you actually, I think Charlie was pretty quick up and so was uh, Councillor Peter as well. So, yeah, Mr Charlie. Yeah. Thanks, David. You say 1.9 to um, overhaul, repair the view park hall. Uh, that's the figure that Council came up with, but that's at least a year out of date, so it certainly won't be any less than that. I wonder whether you shouldn't get another quote. Seems like a lot of money. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks, Charlie. Look, the Yupakanaru Hall is not actually under the Halls Trust, the Rural Halls Trust. It's actually owned by council. Uh, there is no funding under, for it at all uh, in, any, in the 10-year plan. Uh, the long-term plan uh, highlighted that, uh, that absence, I suppose, for Caroline Gray, and she's very enthusiastic in his... Uh, She's going to be contacting a lot of the people in the Yupakanaru area to see if they actually, first of all, want a hall um, or use it for some other purpose. Uh, and at that point, they can see if uh, what and if uh, uh, restoration um, or alternative um, happens. So they're at the beginning of a journey. Um, council did do a comprehensive amount of work in establishing the current state of the hall and an estimate of what it might cost if it was fully restored to modern day standards. So that's where that high figure comes in. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that building is sort of sitting there empty at the moment, but um, it hasn't sort of got a future unless the community rallies in that area, community rallies around it. And that's where Dave is interested, of course, is representing the rural community, which is that area. So. We w so I am talking to Caroline as well, uh, and it's about taking them on a journey and see where they go. Yeah, thanks, um, Helen. Um, and Councillor Peter. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation, David. Um, I have to frame this in a question. So is there uh, any thoughts uh, from the Rural Community Board to change the sign at Fordell that said the spelling is wrong? in the spelling of Wanganui. It's still one of the last places that I know of that has, has not got an H in it. Charlie changed it. I'm sure My understanding can. of the rules were that the signs would get changed when they were due for replacement anyway. Mm. Um, the, there wasn't a specific requirement to race around and change all the names once the call had been made as to that's how the region was yeah. going to be spelled. So presumably that's, that will happen when that sign is due for replacement. That's great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rob. Yep, thank you. Uh, David, um, Rural Halls Trust. I wasn't actually aware of the Rural Halls Trust until last year when Richard presented. But um, So can we get some information about the Rural Halls Trust, how it was set up and, and what halls it's doing and, and what future work it is. Um, and, and maybe there's a council officer that works with you for that, is there, or is it completely yes. independent? No. Uh, my understanding was back in the Michael Laws days, he wanted to just get rid of us, get rid of them, sell them and get rid of them. Um, and somehow the situation we now have evolved from that. He, he was quite happy just to give them to a group who was prepared to administer them, give them a bit of money to look after them, and it was uh, <coughs> out of his head. Hmm? Um, hey, can we just leave David, so uh, you were probably here then, you may recall. Um, it's worked incredibly well, uh, but, the, but the main reason it's worked so well is it's had such good buy-in from each of the communities. Yeah. We have trust meetings every three months, and each hall has a someone delegated to attend the, those meetings and is a trustee. And believe me, becoming a trustee and changing a trustee, the bureaucracy around it is horrendous, which is why I'm still a trustee, because normally when you take on the role of chair, you try and drop one or two other things. 
So the bureaucracy is idea for changing it is, is, is horrendous. My point is that virtually every meeting we have of that group is fully attended. Every one of those seven halls, their representative turns up every three months. It's extraordinary. Um, mm. The funding that council give us just covers the outside, uh, the maintenance of the outside of the building. And I think, and we give a bit of it to them to do some things <coughs> inside, but there is still a, quite a big input from each of those communities to keep those halls maintained in their current condition. So every one of those halls has a significant input from their particular community. It does not all come from the ratepayer. So which are the seven halls? Oh. Well, look, I think I think that's um, oh, yeah, we yeah, we'll, ta we'll take that offline just to clarify that. So, um, yeah, look, I'm keen to keep moving, so um, that's okay. But uh, we could yeah, no, take fine, that offline. Um, but thanks for the response. So, I want to go to Councillor uh, Michael. Um, I'll do it, Peter. Are you aware that the connectivity issue is going to be resolved by one NZ uh, later this year? So, you have a full star link to telecommunication networks complete. And I'm happy to come and speak to the rural board if you need that, that technology overview. Um, but if you're fully aware of it, rock on, cool. Are you aware? Um, I would be most grateful if you would come and speak to the rural community board will, about come. connectivity issues. We now we no longer have a council dedicated resource. Um, one of my jobs is I felt is to look around and see how we can replace that resource. And it sounds like you could be of huge benefit. I, I will come and um, so, um, give the options. We have a meeting on the 12th of June. I will, um, if you're able to attend, I will uh, get I will. you on the agenda. Thank you Thank very you. much for that offer. Thank you for that offer, Councillor Michael. Yeah. Councillor um, Kate. I'm happy to move the recommendation up there, Mr Mayor. Okay, great. I'd like to briefly speak to it. Okay, Councillor Kate, move. Councillor Jenny, second. Um, over to you, Councillor Kate, we, to comment. Could we please have a, um, it could be an email or a paper um, perhaps included under um, the community, uh, under David's item next council board. meeting, just yep. in relation to how the Halls Trust works and what's the status of it. Yep. And I just wonder if going forward um, we might benefit from a, you know, just a one-page written report from, um, from David. I was just going to actually suggest that, but Thank you've you. beat me to the punch. So my recommendation... Um, yeah, that we take going forward is that there is a paper from the Rural Community Board which summarises your commentary, David, um, just to, so we can read it beforehand um, and so the community can read it as well. So that's uh, just uh, actually going forward. All okay, right. and, and Rob did ask that, um, the, the lady from council who helps us out uh, with the rural halls is Tanya Nossiter. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so no further comments there. So. All, my, my final one will be that um, I remind people Wanganui District is 99% rural from a geographical, geographical perspective. It takes up a huge amount of our um, our, 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 our district. So um, uh, yeah, there's a lot, lot of a lot of important issues when you uh, get outside the town boundaries that um, that you're covering off. So thank you, uh, David. Um, so look, uh, no further comments. I'll put the motion on the screen that the council received the report. Rural community. Oh, so the seconder was. Um, Councillor Jenny, was it, I think? Yeah. Um, so that the council received the report, Rural Community Board's chair update. All those in favour? Against? Motion is carried. Uh, so um, our chief executive said to be back in 15 minutes. He's late. So we'll, uh, we'll carry on. Um, so our, our um, next item that we have is 8.12, the Whanganui Centenary Celebration. Um, there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes, and I invite... Um, uh, Deputy Mayor Helen, um, uh, Kelly and Ariel. Um, so I think maybe the first time you guys have presented here, but you're very welcome and um, great to have you here to uh, talk to um, to talk to talk to this uh, this item. Ariel, yeah. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Ariel, I'm introducing the Whanganui Centenary Celebration Report in my role as the event coordinator. I'll take it as read, but I'll just highlight a few key points for you. 
uh, the aim of the festival is to celebrate 100 years since Whanganui was declared a city with the aim to celebrate our history, our heritage and our community, acknowledging the achievements, nurturing our aspirations for the future. The celebration will be called the Whanganui Heritage Festival. It's being coordinated in-house by council in conjunction with the Whanganui Regional Heritage Trust and will replace Heritage Month this year. The festival will be a 10-day event running from the 19th to the 28th of October with two main events. The Our Stories exhibition is a collection of our community stories told by the community for the community taking place over the duration of the festival. There will also be a street parade that follows a similar format to our Santa parade um, over Christmas, which will be accompanied by food stalls and music down the avenue to be held on Saturday the 26th of Labor Weekend. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ira, that nice summary there. Helen, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks. Thank, uh, look, thank you to Ariel for picking up the, uh, the work. Um, so, I, as most of you know, I'm um, a, trust, a trustee and co-chair on the Wanganui Regional Heritage Trust, um, but it was really uh, this, I think it was the end of last year, and I'd heard other cities and places cel make, celebrating major events and I thought well where's our next big one and, it, and Scott Flutie our heritage advisor said well actually Whanganui became a city a hundred years ago in 2020 you know in 2024 and I thought well that's really cool and so Mayor Andrew's been really supportive of that and so that's how we started this collaboration so the Heritage Trust will lend all of its um, uh, knowledge from the last uh, years doing the Heritage Festival uh, they didn't have the resource to do a Heritage Month this year uh, and it was really great to be able to collaborate with Council on what will be, we hope, a really great party and a great opportunity to tell the stories uh, over the last 100 years. So there'll be a lot more information rolling out over the last next few months, and we've already got organisations wanting to participate, and I've already had phone calls from uh, tour organisers out of town saying, we've heard this is happening, can you confirm? Because we've already booked our accommodation, we just want to make sure it's actually going ahead. So there's quite a lot of interest already, so it's great. So thanks, Ariel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Ariel. So do any uh, questions uh, to this uh, particular item? Councillor uh, Ross. <coughs> Might be a car park question. Um, institutions like our regional museum and our river operators, have they been reached out to? They are. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Rob. Yeah, um, yeah Helen, what does um, turning a city actually mean? Does it mean reaching a certain population? Yes, it does. Um, there were certain criteria. I think it was somewhere around the region of 20,000 back, back in the day, 100 years ago. Now you've got to be 50,000. So we're getting back to that status. So we're currently not a city. We were 100 years ago, but we're not oh. now. But we're getting there. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, because you know. so 100 years ago, you had to be 20,000. We got there. Then, of course, we haven't kept up as populations have grown. The, the legal definition of a city has the number of people have increased. So now you've got to be 50,000 to be a city. But we're. So anyway. Well, hopefully they don't, don't change get too it complicated. It's not, <laughs> it's not a big decision today. Yeah, yeah, no. Hopefully they don't change it next year uh, to 60,000. <laughs> it's just in our reach. Uh, Councillor Philippa. Oh, you're, you're off. Okay, great. Okay, Councillor Kate, thank you. Uh, Councillor Charlotte, thank you. Um, any comments on this item? Yeah. No, it's the Deputy Mayor's birthday today to, uh, to Whanganui, those are listening. So, uh, yes, happy birthday. <laughs> no, no, she's not 100. <laughs> she's not even 50. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Councillor um, uh, Philippa, yeah. Yeah, um, I just want to... Uh, congratulate um, whoever, sorry, it might say, who's come, had, had realised this opportunity. Um, I think it's really great we, to celebrate um, something like this. Um, about 115 years ago, a couple of us realised Billy Webb, New Zealand's first professional sculling champion, it was going to be 100 years, and so started that event. Um, and it's um, and still, still alive and growing. Um, 
so I congratulate you on this, and I think um, there's opportunities to kind of take this forward. Just have it, you know, there's a one-off celebration, but obviously Heritage and Heritage Month or whether something else morphs into this. Um, but yeah, we've just got so much to celebrate around Heritage, and we really need to. Yeah, ju I mean, in brief, I just I was just at a national beach sprint champs last weekend, and and I talked to someone that had some major live streaming and drones and stuff, and I talked to them about it about the Billy Webb, and they said absolutely events like special, real special events, you know, that's something we've got, and this is something we've got too, um, and I think they can all work together. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, so no more uh, comments. Um, look, I, I, I you often hear me talk about. Uh, Wanganui's points of difference, their, their arts and creative, the awa and our heritage. And so I think it's great to celebrate uh, our heritage and to deepen that uh, that point of difference for us. So uh, great. So look, uh, no further comments. I'll um, move that uh, the council receive the report Wanganui centenary celebration. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. All those against? Item, uh, the motion is carried. Thank you. And thank you, Ariel. Thanks, uh, Helen. All right, um, now we're going to move on to, um, back to item 8.8, .8, uh, which is the accelerated procurement for 24-25 Three Waters Capital Works. Welcome. Um, uh, you just, just turn the microphone. Just uh, right, uh, right. Uh, right other button. That's it. Brilliant. And Hi. <laughs> Kia ora, good afternoon. Um, I'm Nikki Ni. Nee. I'm the project engineer for Three Waters from Crinto's team. So I just sent in Crinto's apologize. He couldn't make it today. And also, I just realized that half an hour ago. So <laughs> it's a big day for no, well, me. Well <laughs> done, Nikki. And you're very welcome to the table. So uh, um, and just uh, hopefully you can relax as much. We're not that scary. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, Dave, to be my support person today. And I also want to apologize in advance in case I made some horrible burping noises. Not me, it's the baby. <laughs> Sometimes I can't control it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's move to the paper. So today we are here to try to seek approval from the counselor about the procurement plan of our. Um, 2024 to 2025 Three Waters Capital Works. So as you may know, la we did the same thing last year and we combined 16 projects together from Three Waters and Transportation as a project package and then tender it out through two-stage procurement methodology uh, while stage one is ROI to shortlist the contractors for each project. And we have a really quicker and easier uh, stage two RFX to uh, choose the best or optimum contractor for each project. And we do find lots of advantages from last year's process as um, it's proof is with the case studies and the real, like the uh, results shows that the this new, I would call it new procurement methodology, help us save lots of time and cost, and also um, let us achieve or award more projects than the previous uh, financial year. And the good thing is last year was, uh, not last year, uh, the current financial year. It's the only financial year we uh, run out all the carryover from the previous financial year, so which means the money has been used and the project has been done. And so um, at the end of last year's uh, procurement process, we also uh, run the debrief sessions with the contractors, not only to give them the feedback, like how can they do better for next time, but also like we are keen to learn from them, like what's the shortage of this process and how can we do better for next time. So we do learn a lot of lessons from uh, the debrief sessions, which you can see from the uh, council papers. So um, this year we are like more confident to run another 12 months trail with these uh, improvements to 
uh, to repeat the process. And we are also looking forward to do um, another three years uh, package if this 12 years trial, like the results looks good. So yeah, that's all and happy to take questions if any. Right, thank you. Nikki, you did very well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and the baby didn't speak up either, so. Yeah, good um, job. <laughs> so do we have any questions from around the council? I don't see any questions. You must have done such a, oh no, there's yeah. one, uh, Councillor Kate. And this might be an unfair question, question of you, Nikki, um, but one of the things I've been thinking about lately is the comparisons, one of the comparisons with the health sector and the um, council sector or the three waters sector. Um, you know how Pharmac have, a, um, it's a drug buying agency that buys drugs nationally for the nation. Has there been any discussion or talking about um, about, you know, as we move into this, um, getting more efficient about three waters, um, any thought given to buying product for the nation? It's sort of using procurement nationally, or is it not appropriate in this sector because we make most of what we need anyway, nationally? I'll look Sorry, over to that's probably a question for the chief executive. Yeah. So. Three Year Worship, the, we do participate in what they call all of government contracts. So it deals that are struck at a national level that often give us access to discounts or, or better prices through um, greater buying power from adding up to the rest of our sectors. Um, I'm not aware that for infrastructure there's any such all of government deals. It's usually things like um, uh, vehicles with um, dealers or um, uh, consumables with offices and those kind of things. What I would say though is um, there is definitely opportunities on the table that we're, we're already actively exploring with our neighbours around how can we collaborate so that we get better buying power by going to the market once. Uh, and it's something that I know was done in the past when streetlights were upgraded to LEDs uh, and multiple councils banded together so that you could get a better price and buy uh, the new lanterns in bulk under one single contract. So um, short answer is kind of, but no, but we do our best uh, in the absence of a national deal. Great, thanks, you. Thanks. Oh, can I just add, um, in terms of uh, legislation, what we're looking at in terms of UV, there is conversations in terms of buying in bulk uh, because there are quite a few councils that are looking at this process. So, yeah, we have, like David mentioned, we have been looking at ways and how we can sort of streamline it um, because, like I say, we're, we're definitely in the same boat. So doing a one sort of purchase order bulk buy uh, would make sense and it's a lot cheaper to purchase them if you're doing it in the bulk. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah, um, thank you for that presentation, Nikki. Um, Dave, um, this this process then, does this mean that um, there'll be um, a number of contracts let at, a, at one particular time which might be picked up by one company to do say three, as opposed to individually. I can probably answer that. Uh, so the projects are from our annual plan and long-term plan. Yeah. So uh, for the first stage one, the ROI, we will give the whole project list to the potential or who's interested. We're going to put it on the tender link so it's open to the public. Yeah. So who's interested on any projects, they can raise their hands up and they need provide the track records, the relevant skills and some like enough information for our evaluation panel to evaluate and we gonna based on their score to rank them by the uh, different tier like the contractors will be tiered if it's like tier one which is they always have high higher score than other company then they can be assigned to the high complexity projects and okay. if they are tier three which is quite low they can do only like low complexity job. 
Okay. Yeah. So this change of process is not going to uh, inhibit the number of potential tenderers, is it? No. No. David? Yeah. Through your worship, I may just jump in just to add to what the Nikki was setting out there. Um, what the team are effectively doing is forming a, a, a panel of contractors. This approach has been around for many, many years, um, and we did effectively trial it last year. The team have been through a lessons learned process with our contractors to, to review what happened last year. They've made some improvements, and now we're bringing it back, saying we think we got a really good result last year. We want to do it again. But absolutely, the intention is that we, we build a panel during stage one, and you identify the contractors that you want to be on the panel. But then you call the work off during stage two as you go. And the intention is not that all of the work goes to one contractor on the panel, but it's a way of getting it to the market quicker so that we can get our job done and actually do what we said we were going to do for the community when we set our capital budgets. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Jenny, second. Great. So, uh, comments? Councillor Peter. Yeah, um, thank you for the report. And I will be voting for this. And in particular, because it, it's a win-win for everybody, as far as I can see. And in particular for the Maori and cultural considerations, early engagement is a priority for them. So, no, it gets my vote. Thank you. Okay. No further comments. Uh, so I'll um, put the motion on the screen uh, that the Council adopts Option 1, Accelerated Procurement Plan for 24-25, Three Waters Capital Works. This will involve an accelerated procurement process through bundling a selection of major works for, for the 2024-25 uh, uh, from the long-term plan and annual plan simultaneously through early contractor engagement with a selected panel of local regional suppliers. All those in favour? Uh, against? Motions carried. Right. Thank you very much. Um, no, we'll just uh, carry on. Um, so um, I'm going to move to eight, item 8.9, request for adoption solid waste by law. Um, I think uh, Hannah, um, and I'm not sure whether Elise is here, but uh, just you, Hannah, so welcome. Hello again. A fairly simple one, hopefully, today. This is just a repeat of the paper that was raised at the SNP meeting on the 30th of April. Um, that recommendation was to bring it to council for adoption um, and just to note that the come into force date is um, based on the decisions at SNP the 1st of July, not the 1st of June. Um, but otherwise, I'm right. happy to take the paper as read. Okay. Let me just make that. Okay. All right. Happy to move. Councillor, uh, Councillor Josh to second. Um, right. Is there any comments? No? Okay. No comments. So I will um, put the motion on the screen uh, that the council confirm. Um, I'll just uh, take it. Uh, I'm not going to read all of that. So uh, A to D. Um, Unless, unless uh, anyone else, uh, so I assume that the public can see it on, online, so we've all read it and seen it, so I'm going to um, put the motion on the screen from uh, items A to D, um, all those, uh, so all those in favour, against, motion is carried. Thank you. Right, as so we move to item 8.10. Uh, land acquisition um, that the council a uh, delegates authority to the chief executive to finalise the purchase and execute the sale and purchase agreements for the following three properties for a total cost of 3.916 million. 133 Victoria Avenue through to 36 St Hill Street, referred to as the Wanganui Furnishes, Furnishings Properties, and 263 and 65 to 71. Ridgeway Street, referred to as the Flynn Properties, number 3, 45 to 49 Victoria Avenue, and 51 to 61 Ridgeway Street, referred to as Wakefield Chambers Properties. Um, so do we have um, Sarah? Uh, 
Interesting. I'm going to pass over to the Chief Executive and also Sarah O'Hagan um, after that. Through you, Worship. I'm just going to um, set some, some of the scene here and then I'll hand over to Sarah that will go through uh, a little bit more of an, a detailed introduction to the paper. Uh, the context that I want to set out here is, and hopefully will provide some clarity for our community, is around why these properties are being presented to you for acquisition. Um, you have agreed a six-point plan for keeping rates affordable as part of our long-term plan approach. And um, very specifically, one of those points is to grow our non-rates revenue. The idea is that the more money we can get from other sources, the less you need to charge to cover the cost of core services and effectively use council's investments to subsidize those things so that they remain more affordable for our community. <coughs> uh, these properties that we're proposing to acquire will go into the council's city endowment property portfolio. And I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what that is. But the annual return on capital for this purchase will be about 5% or about a, a net of $190,000 a year with room to improve this with a, a bit of management. Now, if you think about that in terms of the proposed service level cuts that we've been consulting the community on and what you could keep instead of cutting, you can see why um, growing on non-rates revenue is part of our six-point plan. The city endowment portfolio. So this is a collection of properties. Um, they're varied. Some are commercial, some are residential, some are reserved land. Uh, but in total, there's approximately 50 properties with a, with a valuation of about $45 million. The portfolio itself is um, described in our investment policy, and it has the objectives of uh, providing community facilities, providing revenue for general operations, i.e. offsetting rates, enhancing the value of the portfolio, uh, maintaining investment in land and property for council, and to enhance opportunities for economic development on a commercial basis where prudent. As you can hopefully see, these acquisitions should tick multiple objectives off against our investment policy. It is also really important to note that the intent is for the city endowment portfolio to be self-funding. And that is the case in, with these acquisitions. Um, all of the profits from the portfolio in recent years have been ring-fenced and put into a reserve. It is that reserve that should fund almost all of the acquisition. The small balance that's left over will be funded from some debt. That debt, though, will be serviced by the future profits of the, um, the portfolio. So there is no cost to the general ratepayer through this acquisition. Sorry, just referencing my notes. The point I would also like to clarify here, because I know there's been a little bit of discussion and debate on social media, is that the acquisition of these properties stands alone as a decision from the long-term plan decisions on whether council invests in a hotel or not. Um, as you can see, hopefully the return on the investment is good enough that it is a sensible addition to the city endowment portfolio whether the hotel occurs or not. I acknowledge the timing is not great and there'll be perceptions that council is predetermining its decision as part of the long-term plan, but I want to be really explicit that that is not the case. There is nothing about this decision today that locks you into developing a hotel and it does not preclude a private developer taking over and developing the hotel for the city. In fact, if no hotel ever occurs, this, this uh, acquisition can still stand on its own. Um, I also want to just address um, why this report is in the public part of the meeting. Um, because the negotiations with the vendors have been concluded and we have signed conditional sale and purchase agreements, the commercial sensitivity and the subject to negotiation clauses that would otherwise put this into uh, the private part of the meeting no longer exist. And I think it's important 
that we conduct as much of our business in the public arena so that we're transparent and accountable to the community. Finally, I know there are some councillors that are considering calling for this report to lie on the table until after the long-term plan uh, process has run its course. That is obviously entirely your prerogative and you can do that. I just want to advise you of the implications because we do have deadlines to go unconditional on the sale and purchase agreements. Those will likely lapse before the LTP process is concluded. And as a result, we would either have to go back and negotiate with the vendors to keep the offers live and extend those deadlines, or we may lose the opportunities because they may choose to sell some to somebody else or take their properties off the market. Um, as I say, your choice, my job is just to make sure you understand the implications. I'll now hand over to Sarah, who will talk a bit more detail about the specific properties at hand. Thank you. Not, not yet. Not yet. No. Uh, Sarah. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, some of what David said I will echo, um, uh, and some of it um, uh, is uh, new or f um, further information. Um, late last year, Council approved that officers enter negotiations with the owners of three sites as a bundle, uh, referred to in the paper as Wanganui Furnishings, um, 33 Victoria Avenue, uh, the Bashfords property next door to that, 39 to 41 Victoria Avenue, and Wakefield Chambers um, back up through our, um, our structure, our CCO structure, uh, 45 to 49 um, Victoria Avenue. Council also approved at the same time that officers could commence a full feasibility assessment, uh, which would result in a business case from, what from which decisions can be taken on the viability of a hotel development. Negotiations commenced directly with the port company directors as owners of the Wakefield Chambers and with Wanganui Furnishings in uh, the Bashford properties through a solicitors acting on our behalf. Uh, this negotiation fell over when we commenced working on the 3941 Victoria Avenue um, with, with the Bashfords. Alongside this, uh, JLL have, been, um, have agreed to help us kickstart the feasibility assessment and we have taken advice from them about the property that we, we, Royal We, would need if a decision is made to proceed with a hotel development. The work with JLL is very much designed to leave the door open for decisions to be made about a private investor completing that development. Through this early work with JLL, it has been confirmed uh, hypothetically that Wakefield Chambers is a suitable anchor site uh, and along Ridgeway Street would support the hotel in form of ancillary spaces um, and potentially additional hotel rooms, depending on the size of the hotel. In addition, JLL have confirmed that access to a car park is a prerequisite for any hotel development, and it is not uncommon for that car park to be located near, not in, the facility. This would or could be able to be located around the corner in the rear of the Wanganu Furnishing site accessed from St Hill Street. Understanding this, a return conditional offer to Wanganui Furnishings was made and accepted, and a proactive approach to the Flynns, who own the two properties along Ridgeway Street, has been made. An agreed sale and conditional sale and purchase agreement was arrived at with the Flynns just late last week. Acknowledging that we have just one, uh, just late last week closed our long-term plan consultation, um, as David mentioned, where the development of a hotel has been presented as a key issue to seek community feedback on, and we are now indeed in the middle of that decision-making process about that and other key decisions. This is a step towards delivery on non-rates revenue as an opportunity. That said, the City Endowment Portfolio has approximately $3.5 million of cash reserves. The combined purchase of these properties is $3.916 million, therefore $416,000 of debt is needed to support the purchase. Servicing that debt is circa 40 k per annum. Revenue from the purchase is around $240,000 per annum and there is room to improve that that revenue is made up of seven um, existing leases in Wakefield Chambers, five leases on the ground floor of the Flynn properties, 
uh, and a lease to be drawn up, which is woven into the, the conditional agreement with Whanganui Furnishings. Regardless of the role that Council decides to take in the hotel and car park development, this purchase represents a good investment and will bolster the portfolio which has been dormant for a number of years. The feasibility assessment for any future development is now underway and this will produce a full business case upon which Council will be able to make decisions on, acknowledging that in the meantime, long-term plan decisions will also be taken. The request today, finally, the request today is um, to approve delegation to the Chief Executive to move to complete due diligence, particularly on the two contracts for um, Wanganui Furnishings and the Flynn properties. Um, the due diligence is not the same for the purchase of the Wakefield Chambers property because we're just getting it back into our, um, lifting it up from one portfolio to another. Um, I'll take the paper as read and I'm sure there will be questions. Right, uh, Councillor Josh. Thanks, Sarah. I hope this is a relatively simple one. But if if we did go ahead with this purchase, and if in future, for whatever reason, Council decided to divest, uh, either because we didn't go ahead with the hotel development or for some other reason, I imagine that the resale potential would be fairly good, given the income attached to the properties? Uh, based on what we know now, the answer to that is yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rob. Yes, um, um, the contracts, you say there's contracts, I think the Chief Executive mentioned there's contracts on the Flynn properties and the Wanganui Furnishes. So what is the unconditional date of those contracts? Uh, the unconditional date is the 13th of May. 13th of May. Okay, thank you. And the other question is, is the sole reason for purchasing the Wanganui Furnishes site to provide a car park? No, the sole reason for purchasing the Wanganui Furnishing site is to bolster the city endowment portfolio. With the one the secondary reason is if we proceed, the form with which we proceed in a development in, uh, that would be a logical location for a car park. So what's the... The, the strategic value of this investment to buy a property with a one-year lease on it for the for the property. Uh, it's, it, we've got a, a, a one-year lease from the current operators. Yeah. And you and you believe that it would be re-lettable that property? Uh, I, I do believe that that's the case. There's a shortage of retail space in Monganoi. Mm. Uh, Councillor Michael. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just out of interest, why can't the City Endowment Fund uh, make investment decisions by themselves? Why did it come here today? I'll pass to Chief Executive to respond. Uh, through you, Worship, that is because um, acquisitions of property are outside the Chief Executive's delegations and you as Council require me to bring these things back to you for a decision. But prior and holdings, when the holdings had it, they didn't require that oversight? Through you, Worship, I will come back to you on that one because I'm not sure where the threshold for major transactions was under the, the holdings hmm. Um, foundation documents and what they did and did not have to bring back to council. Um, so I'll check and report back. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so because it's come to us as a commercial um, idea, and a lot of us are not actually capable of making these investment decisions, I will ask a question in terms of the ROI on the Flynn properties. Is that 4.1% gross return, which is less than our cost of capital? Um, what is the additional return on those ho hostel upstairs? Do we have that information? 
No, I don't. Um, the upstairs, the Flynn of the mm. Flynn properties. What I understand, we we have to go through some due diligence and go and have a look. Um, mm. But what I've been informed by both the the vendor and the vendor's solicitor is that there is a one bedroom apartment upstairs, and there is other accommodation type um, space upstairs. And at, that at the moment that is um, vacant. Um, there have been no lease information come through on the further terms of sale for upstairs in those two properties. So I can't answer that specifically, Councillor Michael. No, but thank you for that. I won't ask my last question. Thank you. Councillor Ross. Thank you. The possible car park behind Wanganoo Furnishes, I'm constantly getting emails about the shortage of car parking in Wanganui. And Council has acknowledged some time ago that we are looking at the possibility of establishing more car parking in our town. Putting everything else aside, that area at the back of Wanganui Village would be a possible car park for the public and fee paying for the public, which would be income for Council. And if at some stage, maybe, a hotel comes about, it may then convert to another form of car parking. Would that be a correct summation? Um, uh, that's one pathway we could take, um, Councillor Ross, yeah. Uh, the, the, the conversations that we're having through the feasibility assessment, um, it has been made very clear to us that it, it's a prerequisite to have uh, a car park where a hotel would be um, an anchor tenant in that car park. Um, so when people come to stay, they've got to have somewhere to park. Um, so that, that's why there's that um, integration um, and integrated approach. But if a hotel did not come about, it's a no-brainer. That would be a fee-paying car park. It, as I've said, it would be one course of action that we could take. David, uh, yeah. uh, through your worship, just a comment from me on, on that, because uh, um, Sarah's correct, it's it's one possibility, but you are right, there is demand for car parking close to the, the, the city centre right now, and demand for long-term rental car parkers from uh, workers and, and the like, not just day shoppers. Um, so it is absolutely an option is if there was no hotel but we still needed more car park and it wouldn't have to be an expensive multi-story car park it could simply be uh, an at-grade ground level car park like some of the other off-street car parks that council already provides but we haven't done any work to investigate that beyond identifying it as a, a potential opportunity the only other comment i would make is that that does fit with the purpose of the city endowment portfolio uh, in terms of it being a provision of a community facility. I'm just happy postulating possible, possibly, possibility. Oh, great, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you. So with the um, uh, Wakefield Chambers b the building, um, and then the, the, the land from there, the, what's called the Flynn's properties, to the um, St Hill Street, why would there not be enough room there to provide car parking for a 60-bed hotel? The Has there been any study at all done into a site coverage plan um, to, that may support the case of that being the only purchase? The, the work, <coughs> excuse me, the work that we've um, done to date with JLL um, includes developing a concept plan for the anchor site, Wakefield Chambers, and extending along uh, Ridgeway Street to the edge mm -hmm. of St Hill Street. Um, uh, the, the work that they've done so far shows that we would use all of that space mm -hmm. for circa 100 rooms and supporting ancillary spaces, so um, things like cafe, reception, meeting rooms, etc. Um, and doesn't indicate at this stage that there would be enough room on that space alone for a car park as well without 
breaching um, and going down um, a very difficult planning path because there's and I, and I don't understand the technical um, planning information here, but the path of least resistance from a planning perspective is to keep the facades in place because both buildings have heritage value um, and uh, keep the height of the buildings to a particular height. Um, which gives us just enough room for um, that circa 100, 104 rooms and the necessary and ancillary spaces for a ho hotel without um, creating difficulties in the planning space. Okay. So I recently stayed in the Sojourn Hotel in Wellington and they have a car parking about 50 metres away in the, in the countdown. It was a nightmare. It rained all the time. Now, why, why is this effective to consider that this adds to a hotel by having a car park, which you've got to walk through the weather to get to, and if you're a guest at that hotel? That seems to be a negative. Uh, all I can say in response to that is that we're taking some advice from um, people that are in the business of developing hotels and know what's, what works. Um, and uh, they don't have the same impression. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jenny. Thank you. Um, my questions are around the optics of this. So roughly, what date were the contracts signed? Roughly. Don't need the specific date. Uh, so... Um, I probably need to go a little bit back to the beginning. So at the end of October last year, you asked me to go away uh, and negotiate the three different, or well, three properties, one of which is different as a bundle. That negotiation um, <coughs> uh, came to a stop, um, uh, I'm just trying to remember, probably towards the end of February, March. Um, we, didn't, we didn't come, we didn't realise until the end of February, March, that we weren't going to get those three properties as a bundle. Um, in parallel, we started having conversations with JLL at around about the same time, uh, and we pulled together a team that took a few weeks. Um, we had a site visit with the team in uh, April, in early April. Um, it wasn't until we got to that stage and phase where it became obvious that we could leapfrog that middle site um, and, and run along Ridgeway Street and that that, that would be a viable um, way forward. So, so that's the backdrop and context. So the, the initial bundle fell over towards the end of February, early March. Um, then when we went into new negotiations um, with Whanganui Furnishings first uh, during early March. Uh, and my memory fails me slightly, um, Councillor Jenny, but I don't think we had a signed um, agreement for that until was the time that David listed went, went to see Bailey's himself on a personal matter. Um, so that was only about four or five weeks ago. Uh, and in conjunction with that, I started a, a conversation with the Flins um, by reaching out to them. Um, the gentleman was away, I met with him. Um, and then we, we started negotiating through a solicitor. So the second contract, the Flynn's contract, was we just agreed on a price late last week. Okay, so this is my question. Given that this had to come here today because it's got an unconditional date of the 13th of May, and this is the day of the council meeting, and acquisitions have to come through a council meeting, and we have deliberations finishing on the 7th of June, and we had a long-term plan document that was clear that it included the hotel which was going out to the public in February, March. Why was the unconditional date not made after the 7th of June so that we didn't conflate the matters and look to the community like we were going ahead with something? I mean, I know what we're doing and I support it, but the timing of it to me is really poor for the optics with our community. All we would have needed was another three weeks. Um, through your worship, I'll answer this one. I think aid negotiations are a, a two-way process and we can't always yeah. get what we want in terms of uh, defining the dates. Um, but also, I think in management's defence, we are following through on direction and instructions that 
council has given us to pursue these things. Um, With all due respect, we didn't ask for this to come to us now. No. In the middle of a long-term plan public consultation period. And I've been really clear that whilst I appreciate the, the optics, these are two separate issues. This is an acquisition for the city endowment portfolio that enables the possibility of a hotel, but it stands alone as an investment for council, which will grow our non-rates revenue, which is what you've asked officers to do to keep rates affordable. And I get the point about the timing, but I don't think we're necessarily in a position when we're trying to take opportunities as they present themselves on the market to, we can't always get our own way. And maybe we can take a learning from this. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Councillor Charlie. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Sarah. Look, I've got all the figures in front of me, and, and I'm pretty sure I get it. But for the people who are listening and watching, take the hotel out of the equation. If we purchase these properties, is our return better than the money we make from interest? If we purchase these properties, we only have to borrow $416,000 to purchase them because the rest is in reserves. The cost of servicing that is around $40,000 and the Chief Financial Officer has provided me that detail. The revenue from the combined purchase is 200, circa $240,000 per annum. So yes, it pays for itself and some. If you're considering the, 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 the money we, ha we have, that return on that money is better than having it in the bank. In a prop I believe so, yes, because the purpose of the city endowment fund is to invest it in property, not to invest it in the bank. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, there's no further uh, questions. Um, so can I... Uh, Anyone would like to move? Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Helen. Aye. Aye. Hang on. Uh, and uh, seconder is Councillor, yes. Councillor Josh. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, what's that? Did Aye. Highlight, yeah, so it's, it's been given to me. It was, um, this, we hadn't had a second there, so it's we're kind of it's your call, Andrew. I'm not going to do it. Okay, sorry. Yep, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, what um, I'll just I'll hear what you've got to say and then. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to make it really clear in A that the, um, the purchase depends on sufficient due diligence. Um, I am aware that that will be within the sale and purchase agreement, but I'd like it to be stated quite clearly in the motion. Okay. Um, is that... Uh, Where? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Okay. You've already made that amendment. Yeah, so that's Kapai. what I wondered. How can you get... Yeah, that's pretty... No, clear. that's yeah, it. That's I just okay. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So it's all very fluid, this situation. So now, great, thank you. So it's acceptable. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's no, all good. I thought you were going to throw a bombshell at us. So that's yeah, all good. <laughs> um, so the mover was uh, Counts, no, Deputy Mayor Helen, and the seconder was Councillor Josh. <laughs> Helen, are you okay with that? As long as it can be fulfilled uh, by the officers. Through you, Worship, uh, Councillor Charlotte, to check with me on this amendment before the council meeting, it was all, always our intention and one of the conditions in the sale of purchase agreement is we are satisfied once we've completed a due diligence process. So the amendment is simply asking me to do something I was going to do anyway. Okay, co uh, comments? So we'll go to Deputy Mayor Helen. Okay, somebody better time me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stopwatch is on. <laughs> yeah. You get started. All right, uh, yeah, very, I mean, this is, uh, purchasing, spending money on something is always difficult for council. It's difficult at a time you're going out, out for uh, long-term plan consultation and especially 
when it is touching on something that we are consulting on. So all those things are very awkward, and that's where a lot of councils are feeling uncomfortable today. Uh, however, we've got to leave the emotion aside and the influence from what we might feel from the public aside and decide on the facts and what is presented to us if this is something you should vote for or not. And I just want to point out, Council did approve these negotiations going forward. Okay? We approved this going forward. And as the Chief Executive has said, you can't always control the timing. Um, so it is up to each of you today to decide if this is a good deal or not. I just want to note that we technically already own Wakefield Chambers. It's a significant heritage building that has largely been empty for a very, very long time. We are technically having to buy it back because we technically put it into a separate uh, company structure, but essentially it's still our building. Um, and council officers have seen that there's strategic assets surrounding that that then make the whole site viable <laughs> for uh, maximising some uh, income in the future. One of those things might be a hotel. And I have no, made no secret of the fact that I think that a hotel is, is an, actually a strategic asset that this, uh, this whole district needs going forward. And that's, but that's for convincing, uh, that's for those arguments later on when we, we decide on the LTP. But it is still an important one for me. And the reason being is if you've got a, an ACVD, we've got a lot of different owners of small parcels of land on which heritage is on just about every one of them. Very, very difficult for any hotel operate, any, any investor in a hotel building and operation to ever uh, find that easy to do. Not only do they have to buy the bit of land, they then have to get the resource consent to perhaps modify the heritage that's on there. And it's just like, oh, too hard. So this is a possibility that we might be able to make happen through this purchase. Whether that happens or not, may, it may never. Um, it's still not a bad investment. Uh, so we've either got to start getting a bit gutsy and doing some stuff, whether it's investing in property or it's go, m slowly moving down, making it more possible for a hotel, I noticed that Salwyn District, they actually already own some land that they're trying to get a hotel investor buying into. Uh, and, just, and there's many councils around the country enabling hotel investment to come in. And that's certainly what I would like, is that we don't actually ever build a hotel. So, and that's not what we are going today. But I just want to say that there are still, we need to be a bit strategic and start buying some land so that we can actually do some stuff and you actually also want to be able to make some money out of it, which the staff have shown the dollars are there. We've already done a hotel attraction study. There's a whole lot of more work around feasibility. Who knows if the hotel would ever happen? So, but it, you know, that's where a lot of the talk's gonna be. Um, so it comes down today, is this a good investment for us? Is this what we want to go into? And we've already, my big thing, I've said that the staff have already asked, we gave permission for them to go ahead. We asked them to go ahead and do this. So if we actually reject it today, it's like, be a very strange decision. Okay, be a very strange decision. So just think carefully about what next steps you want to take today. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Michael. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm quite open and really open for people to change their mind here, but I'm very uh, flipping backwards and forwards on this. And the reason why I flip backwards and forwards on this is because I look at the 24th of October and what we told the CE to go and do, he's already got approval to do. And then we've got today's area where we're getting too distracted with hotels. So forget the hotel for a moment. But I do want to clarify that up, it's up to $1.5 million for feasibility, business case and design in full. Uh, that was what was agreed um, up to. So at any point in time when things um, do not go the way we go, then that will be cancelled, the money will be banked. So I want to put that clear. I want to put here that um, I believe experts should be making these decisions and not us. 
we're not financial analysts. We shouldn't be making decisions on purchasing property. We should be giving governance decisions on the guide rails for what council should and shouldn't provide. And we haven't got that. So, like for instance, the main cost of capital is about 5.5% in the moment. Uh, I would like to see 8% and above on all commercial returns. If it meets that criteria, buy as much as you want. Um, because that's more money in the bank, less rates being produced for you guys, and you get lower rate bills. And that's what everybody wants, right? So no one can disagree with that. So I had to look at this in terms of financial uh, information, and this report does not have enough financial information in here for me. It doesn't look out to five years. It doesn't look at cash flow forecasts. It doesn't look at opportunity costs. We cannot say that the, it's no cost for 3.5 million because there's opportunity costs at 3.5 million. We could be investing it somewhere else. We could be putting it to pay off debt and save 5.5%. So the whole thing needs to look at a gross return. Um, we're going to be furnishings, 8% gross return. Yep, buy it, all good. Uh, Flynn Properties, 4.1% gross returns. I really do need to see that additional revenue because that's effectively losing us money. From what I can see, it's losing us money. Wayful Chambers, 6.4% gross returns. We already own it. it. Makes total sense. So I'm hoping someone will change their mind on this because at the moment I'm voting no because there's not enough information in here for me to make a credible, critical financial decision based on this information. Um, but I do note 23rd of October, uh, what the CE has already got approval to go and do. So thank you. Okay, uh, over to the Chief Executive. Through your worship, just to clarify uh, Councillor Law's uh, final point there, you delegated authority for me to buy um, three properties, one of which is different from the property that is here today. And it was, it was approval as a bundle so hence why it's back here today for a new decision because we are effectively doing something that is slightly different from what you authorized me to do. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Josh. Thank you. Yeah, I'm obviously going to support this as well. Um, I'm going to support it because from a investment perspective, I think it's been articulated very clearly uh, that the, the, the bulk, bulk of the, um, the, the, the funding of this comes from the cash reserves in the City Endowment Fund, uh, that the debt funding is a relatively minimal amount of that cost and that the returns coming from those buildings covers it sufficiently plus provided, provides us with income afterwards. So from that perspective, I, I understand that it will generate a return. But what I really want to talk about is the feasibility study for the hotel, which is absolutely critical in terms of council choosing whether or not to push the go button on this project. And for me, a feasibility study needs to look at, first of all, the, um, the, the, the broader economic context around uh, the viability of a hotel in Whanganui. Um, but also, it needs to look at the specifics of where that hotel might be located and what some of the constraints uh, or challenges with some of those locations might be. And so by purchasing these buildings, which gives us a option if we do choose to go down the path of building a hotel, by purchasing them, we're actually um, giving ourselves options in terms of understanding through the feasibility study what the specifics of developing of the, on those sites would look like. And as an elected member, as a governor, when making these decisions, I need to understand those specifics. And this decision today allows us to do that. Um, and I just want to finish off by talking about the issue of predetermination, because that's been something that's uh, been milling around over the last couple of days in particular, the idea that council has actually already made a decision on this issue. And I want to go back to the 2021 long-term plan and I'm going to use an example that is generally banned in this room, but the roofing of the velodrome, where prior to that decision being made not to roof it, we had completed a feasibility study which indicated a certain direction. There were a number of us that initially voted for it to go into the consultation document with the preferred option being to roof it. I was one of them. At the end of that process, after reading all the information uh, from the public, uh, reanalyzing the feasibility studies, I changed my vote. And I have no doubt that there is integrity and governance around this table and that every <coughs> elected member is genuinely open-minded uh, on this proposal. All we are doing today is giving ourselves a realistic set of options so that we can properly make that decision. 
And I think it's good governance, quite frankly, to do that, with the added advantage of there being a return on investment too. So I will happily support this today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter. Yes, thank you. And, uh, uh, and the, um, I would first like to acknowledge the, the work and initiative that uh, Sarah has <coughs> done. Uh, congratulations. But I have a different point of philosophy and, uh, philosophy and the process. Um, therefore, at first, it should have gone through to the Aspirations and Projects Committee. Where we would have had a business case for the purchase of properties. And to also say that we do have uh, one, a lever to pull, and that is our CCOs and investment. And I would say that 5% would not pass the threshold of a good project to invest in. So I will not be supporting this motion. And yeah, those are the reasons why. <coughs> Your Worship, I'd, I'd like to move a procedural motion at this stage, please. No, I'm that. And that procedural motion is that uh, 25.2 permit procedural motions to close and adjourn the debate that the item 8.10 land acquisition should be adjourned to the next council meeting on June the 25th. The what? What's that? Next council meeting on June the 25th. All right, so my understanding is we, we will go to uh, vote on this straight away. Uh, so your, so if I just, so I can be very clear about this the procedural motion uh, is that uh, to adjourn, uh, sorry, adjourn debate uh, can be taken up to two speakers have spoken to, to in support of the report motion and two against. Yeah, or, or at the discretion of the chair. Or at the discretion of the chair. Um, so once procedural motion is moved and seconded, the chair needs to put it to the vote immediately, which is what I'm going to do, mm -hmm. without discussion or debate. Mm -hmm. The procedural motion is lost. Uh, no member may move further procedural motion to close or adjourn the debate uh, with the next 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so the item, uh, the business I've been discussed specifically, 8.10 land acquisition should be adjourned to a council meeting on 25th June. 2024 and not be further discussed at this meeting. So I'll just finish there. Councillor Kate. Does moving a procedural motion allow for questions as to the implications of the procedural motion should it no. be passed? So that's what I would like to understand if I can ask a question. Sure. What would be the implications should that procedural motion be successful? Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. I know the Chief Executive did uh, go through that, but it's worthwhile hearing from Thank him you. again. Sorry. Through you, Your Worship, the main implication would be we would have to go back to the vendors to see if we could negotiate a, a new deadline for going in unconditional so that we could keep the offers live until after the next council meeting. So, uh, Further question, follow-up question. If my memory serves me correctly, the 14th of May is the conditional date? 13th. 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 So what are we? That's a week. Seven, six days away. So should you not be able to get an extension to the contract, then the contract would lapse. Is that right? Correct. short adjournment to consider this matter. Okay. That's, uh, that's, no, right? that's fine. I'm happy with that. Your um, uh, Worship, the standing orders state that you've got to put this immediately to the meeting. Okay. Well, I just wanted to understand. Yeah. Um, not, it's not up for the deb de debate or discussion. Okay. It's purely a vote. Okay. So we've got one person that wants to adjourn the meeting to um, what's your purpose of adjourning the meeting, Councillor Kate? I need to think about that. <coughs> Okay, before you make a decision. I, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, it doesn't mean to say we're going to have further uh, discussion, but uh, I'm just... So, so um, I'm 
How, how long is reasonable? Uh, I'm saying three or four minutes? Okay. Um, okay, well just a final point of clarification, Councillor Michael. Um, Rob's pointing to the next council meeting, but he's put a date on it. Um, does that preclude us from having an emergency council meeting? No, it doesn't. So we could have an emergency council yeah. meeting? No, cool. I, I'd imagine, look, I'm, I'm uh, probably... That's what I'm... Yeah. I imagine that we'd be able to do, have an extraordinary council meeting. The intention is... All right, so um, it's now yeah. uh, three minutes to four. My suggestion is that we're back online at four o'clock in three minutes' time. It's probably time to have a break anyway. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah. Three minutes.
minutes. More than three minutes up. Okay, so uh, we've had time to uh, consider and reflect um, the procedural motion. Um, so I'm going to put the procedural motion that the item of business being discussed, specifically 8.10, land acquisition should be adjourned to a council meeting on 25 June 2024 and not be further discussed at this meeting. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? Oh. Okay. You timed it badly. So the item is lost. Okay, so the substituted motion with the red concluded is. Um, so remind me where we're at. We've had comments. We finished. Yeah, the deliberation. Uh, the, yeah, so we we did actually the have a couple more. Don't matter. Sorry, ex <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. Can we just have some order here, please? So uh, we have to have some further questions uh, that we weren't quite finished. Uh, I had uh, Councillor Charlotte, Councillor Rob, and Councillor Ross. Um, so they're not questions. They're comments. Chair. Uh, did I, I say, I, I meant, oh, I meant comments. comments. Yeah, so I meant comments. Okay, great. So if that's what I said, questions, sorry. I meant comments. So uh, well, comments, Councillor Charlotte. Okay. I mean, I shouldn't vote. we take this to the boat first because my commentary, I don't know. Well, no, uh, no, these were comments that we were, inter we, we had an intervention. So as, as we were, all right. Had an intervention prior to comments being finished. So I'm yep. just happy to complete those comments. Okay. Well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, considering my amendment uh, with sufficient due diligence prior to purchase, I can support this motion, uh, considering it is a probable win-win investment with no cost to the ratepayer. Uh, as we are on a journey to seek alternative revenue streams, this acquis acquisition is low risk with current leases in place that appear to make financial sense. Uh, in terms of the possible hotel, this is a real chicken or the egg situation for us to seriously explore options around how we can attract a hotel to provide us with appropriate levels of accommodation. We do need to have tangible options to be able to seek a sufficient business case for the hotel. Uh, so I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ross. Yeah. I'm going to support it. Um, putting aside some of the confusion with the public and some of the councillors about how this came about and the timing and some social media um, outbursts, we, we need to get on with it. And for me, I fall back on two things that were stated in the long-term document. It said, all projects have to satisfy two key two criteria. One is establish demand, two set a feasibility study. So I'm on this journey up to and including the feasibility study. I will support it. Thank you, Councillor Charlie. <clears throat> I've been uh, fairly 50-50 on this, but I've made a decision. I'm not going to support it. It's not quite the original real estate deal we talked about. We've got one property which has only got a 12-month lease on it. We could be end up holding the baby for a long time. And there's nothing out there that gives me confidence there's going to be a developer come forward to build a hotel anytime soon. Because I don't think this appetite or the community got the, uh, the, the, the desire uh, to actually rate power fund this thing. So I'm going to, sadly, I'm going to vote against it. Councillor uh, Rob. We should, I'd ask that you take these three properties separately, please. Each one needs to be spoken to. Uh, they have different merits. And, and I, I would ask to have the opportunity to speak to each of those three properties separately, please. To vote for them or speak to them? I want to speak to the, each of those properties separately and vote it on separately. Okay, you're allowed to, allowed to comment, so um, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So you just comment on them as you as you wish. Yeah. First of all, um, I would say that if there's a bit any indication that the public of Wanganui need of why a council or a local authority of any description couldn't shouldn't run a business, it's here today. First of all, to be discussing property purchasing and property acquisition on the front page of the Chronicle next day is no way to run a business. You know, business people, they know when to hold them, they know when to fold them. You know, and this is a time to fold them. You know, and no, no self-respecting business uh, or, or property developer would do this. That's why we often fail at these sort of things. Now, in saying this, I want to say that I do support the case for a hotel in Whanganui. The case is very, very convincing. And if you go back to the report, and I hope more people in Whanganui read this uh, Haworth HTL report, because it is quite convincing that there's a need for more hotel beds in Whanganui. Just as a point, Whanganui has half the hotel beds that are in Invercargill, Nelson or Whangarei, and two of those are getting new hotels built at the moment. The case is there, but the case is there for a developer. Now, when it comes to these particular properties, I believe that there is room for a hotel development on the Ridgeway Street edge of this um, uh, uh, development. Why are we doing this? Well, we have Wakefield Chambers. And if you look at the um, uh, intersection of uh, uh, um, Ridgeway Street and Victoria Avenue, there's four cornerstones there. Three of them are under threat. They've got seismic issues. And unless there is a beneficial case for spending a lot of money on these buildings, they'll be demolished by 2040. What is this council going to do? I know it's owned by the port now, but it's just a merry-go-round. What's this, this council going to do about um, Wakefield Chambers? I don't think we're going to spend more than a million dollars on seismic strengthening to actually let it for office accommodation. The hotel development gives a good beneficial use and I totally support the conversion of that building. But as for buying the, the Wanganui Furnishers building, to suggest that we need some sort of $21 million multi-storey car park is a, that has been mentioned in the, in the long-term plan, it's just pie in the sky. You know, and to think that this is going to enhance the attractiveness of staying in this hotel when you have to walk 150 metres to park your car through all the weather, that's not going to be attractive. So this Wanganui purchases, Wanganui um, uh, furnishes site does not need to be purchased. And wh what we do need, of course, is the site next door. And it appears that the vendors are uncooperative on this particular site. And so we've got to walk away. That is the site that adds value to the sites down Ridgeway Street, not the, not the Wanganui Furnishes site. And to say it's a good investment, these buildings are a load of junk. Go down to have a look at the buildings down that we're talking about in Ridgeway Street. I'll bet they probably like my building down there, the seismic rating's probably 10 or 11%. I know mine is. You know, what, what's the value in these? Are we going to spend a lot of money on earthquake strengthening if these buildings don't go, if the hotel doesn't go ahead? So what I want to do here today is to vote in favour of purchasing those buildings so that we can, when I say those buildings, those buildings in Ridgeway Street, because I believe that is a feasible development to put in front of a credible hotel developer 
in this country. No, council shouldn't be borrowing 55 million to do this, but I think the case built around the market demand and what we've already got there does present an attractive proposition to a developer. So, Your Worship, what I'm looking for here is to be able to vote for parts of this, not the whole lot all in one, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Philippa. Yeah, um, I mean, firstly, um, disappointed, couldn't, um, but just to be, for clarity, I would have voted for the procedural motion. Um, if if uh, it's given a minute or two, but that's the mayor's discretion. Uh, I'm considering if I support any of these resolutions at this stage, but um, I basically can't support the kind of majority, the, the kind of decision around making this decision prior to the long-term plan deliberations. And while I totally respect all the work of the staff and while I see, you know, while we, um, it was very weird that kind of the delegation to the CE um, to negotiate, in no way did I think that would mean I'd be opening up my board papers in the last yesterday um, to see that this was going to be in the public arena and that we were going to be making a decision to purchase some property prior to making a decision on whether we are going to go ahead um, in the long-term plan with, with a hotel. And I guess for me, that's, that's the whatever way we want to make it look, that smacks of predetermination to, uh, to our community. And I guess, and briefly just going to, to Councillor Josh's point, the difference was three years ago, Josh, it was like half, putting half the lid on the velodrome before we actually made a decision, <coughs> you know? I mean, we didn't purchase any more property prior to we made that decision. We had a velodrome and we were deciding do we roof it or not. We, you know, this is like half roofing it by purchasing some property for it and then making the decision in the long-term plan. Um, and I guess there's other things like, like, uh, while it might look like you know, by, that this looks this looks like a good investment regardless because we're only going to something going to cost us about forty thousand, but we're going to reap you know over two hundred thousand, I think, or whatever that figure is. I've got it here somewhere, and it's in the, in the paper. Uh, it's two hundred thirty-seven k. Yeah, we there, there's just risk all around this. Um, Wongnu Furnishers have been trying to sell that building for some time. My understanding is they want to exit it. So, you know, who's you know, when, when as we move through this whole process and we lose a, we lose a tenant, you know, how can we honestly have the confidence we're going to we're going to um, fill it with another tenant? Unfortunately, um, I have a lot of confidence in our chief executive and his team, but council doesn't have a great recent track record in regard to investment of property. St George's site, <coughs> a collegiate motor run. And I guess just the main, you know, I, you know, I just the transparency and accountability to our ratepayer for me um, has is bound to be somewhat eroded um, prior to going into um, really important um, long-term plan deliberations and decision making. And I just can't see why this whole process could not have been negotiated and held for approximately a month. Um, so that we actually listen to our community first about the hotel, um, and then we then and and with with those vendors well aware of what we're going through, and then we came up and made this decision. Uh, so uh, depending on if these resolutions are taken separately, I'll I'll be considering supporting um, the Ridgeway Street um, at this stage, but but not the others. I just want to be really clear, I am definitely not against the concept of a hotel, definitely not. Um, and I just hope that this whole, pro that, as we, that, that this doesn't, um, I, I mean, I'm confident, well, whatever decision today, but this won't destroy that, but we need to do things um, better and in tune with our community. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Glenda. Thank you. I think we need to remember that the hotel is in the long-term plan 
and no one has made, we, we can't make any decisions about that, otherwise we would be accused of predetermination. This is about purchasing some property for the opportunity of, of some non-rates income, which we have tasked the CE to um, find some opportunities for that. So whether down the track that allows for an opportunity for a hotel there, um, maybe, but we have to wait until we hear back, uh, until we read the submissions and we make a decision through the long-term um, plan process that we are involved in. So I will be supporting this. I think it's a um, great opportunity to um, to gather some non-rates revenue for the purpose of trying to keep our rates down for our ratepayers. Good business decision. And now, uh, last question, Proce last comment from... Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Procedural. If we are voting on each of the three, okay. Not meant to be too pedantic, but I am. If any one or more of those fail, then the wording of the original motion doesn't work. Would it, that, would it then mean that the original motion would have to be reworded on the properties that are left, a new mover and a seconder, and debate on that situation? How, how does that work? Because if we remove, say we don't go for option I, the wording of that motion at the top is not correct. I just, I'm not sure how we proceed if that scenario happened. Right. Yeah, it's just a, just a slight tweak in wording. I'd imagine it's um, up to three and um, up to a cost of 3.916. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And um, cost up to. 3.916 because if one's taken out it's not going to total 3.916 that makes sense so um, sorry mayor I, I, I know what you're trying to do but the problem then is we're technically agreeing so we do one out of three we're saying we'll pay four million for one property uh, I see what you mean. He's, he's like splitting this is quite actually quite complex good point Yeah, so that means we have to vote on all three at once. Yeah. 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 No, that's... Uh... Okay, so I... Um, so you've asked for that. I have considered that, and given the complications and complexities of splitting the three, that appears to be problematic. Okay. You could replace the cost as per the conditional sale and purchase agreements. Okay. So, um, Chief Executive's just informed me that um, in the sale and purchase agreement, the cost of each of those three items is already in the sale and purchase agreement, so we could replace it to say, right, well done, Anna, uh, as per the sale and purchase agreements. And if we take out the total cost, then we're. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor Helen, as the mover, are you okay with that amendment in the wording? I absolutely am. Okay. All right. So that means we can now vote for each separately. Is that correct? Okay. All right. So, uh, no further comments. Um, I will put the motion on the screen that delegate that the Council delegates authority to the Chief Executive to finalise the purchase on the completion of satisfactory due diligence and execute the sale and purchase agreements for the following properties as per the sale and purchase agreement. Uh, and just to elaborate on that, that's for each of the three different... Um, each one separately. So the first one, uh, number one, is... Um, uh, 33 Victoria Avenue, 3 to 36 St Hill Street, referred to as the Wino Furnishing, Furnishings Properties. So, um, uh, all those in favour? Okay. What's that? How many was it? Okay, motion is carried. Uh, and who against? 
Oh, sorry. Yes, good point. Sorry, and, and it's got a little uh, method here of recording that. So, so move to item two, sixty-three and sixty-five to seventy-one, Ridgeway Street, referred to as the Flynn Properties. Uh, all those in favour? Okay. Uh, all, I just want to record those against. Okay. Motion is carried. Uh, item number three, 45 to 49 Victoria Avenue uh, and 51 to 61 but Ridgeway Street referred to as Wakefield Chambers Properties. All those in favour? Uh, just for the record, those against? Okay. Uh, motion is carried. Right. Uh, I think we've finished that one. Um, great. It's it. Just getting that one is okay. Okay. Okay, so moving to no, um, item, sorry, just to have everyone's attention, please. Uh, moving to item nine, motion to exclude the public, that the public be excluded from the following parts of the proceedings of this meeting, namely items listed in the table on page 85 of the agenda. Um, 8.7. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, that, yeah, when she was here with the baby. That was the water safety has been taken... Yeah, it's been, been, oh, been, oh, I've been taken. Apologies, didn't hear that. Thank you. Yeah. I'll move this. I'm happy to second. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, all those in favour? Against? Motion's carried. So, we now move to. Is that sorry? Right. 